Hello, everybody. This is the Franklin County Physical Court, uh, August to Thursday, August the 27th, 2020 work session. We welcome everybody here today. Thank you for being here. And uh, before we get into our, our agenda, we have quite a lengthy agenda. I do want to start with uh, uh, Tommy Russell. If you will come on, I'd like to start with you. Mr. Russell, are you on the air? Yes, sir, I am. Okay, uh, Tommy, uh, first of all, I, uh, on behalf of all of us in Franklin County, we send our thoughts and prayers to those people that have been hugely affected by Hurricane Laura that is now heading in our direction. And so, Tommy, I'd like for you, if you would, to update our community on uh, the possibilities of, uh, we understand, of some major wind as well as rain uh, that could be coming our way. Please update us. Yes, sir. We, uh, we had a conference call with the National Weather Service this afternoon at two o'clock, uh, specifically about Laura. Uh, good news is from yesterday to today, um, the impacts for our, our community have changed, uh, I would say significantly. Uh, we're still into one to three inch rain category. Uh, beginning tomorrow afternoon and continuing through Saturday afternoon. But the uh, sustained winds that we're looking at are like are 20 miles an hour. We might get some 30 mile an hour gusts uh, and it could be some higher gusts in thunderstorms. Uh, but the, uh, the big wind event that people were talking about like Ike or back uh, like maybe 2012 when we had a lot of wind damage, uh, it appears that those winds are going to subside before they get to us. There is a, a larger chance for rain, uh, for heavier amounts of rain south of us. But as far as flooding and flash flooding go, the National Weather Service Office out of Louisville has uh, deemed those uh, chances uh, relatively low. Uh, so we need to get through starting tomorrow afternoon and going through Saturday afternoon. This thing is still moving relatively quickly. And it should go in, come in and come out, and hopefully uh, we won't develop a squall line or anything that stalls out over us. So uh, the one to three inches, I think everybody's leaning to lesser amounts of rain uh, than what we were originally looking at. Okay, anybody have any questions for Tommy? Tommy, thank you. Appreciate you coming on. Thank you for giving us that update. And once again, I do say to all of those that had been have been so adversely affected by this huge storm that hit the coast of Louisiana. We send our thoughts and prayers to you. With that being said, uh, Tommy, if, you'll, if you've got time, stay on. Uh, we don't know. We may have some questions for you, but uh, otherwise, thank you so much for, for giving us an update. The first item on the agenda is the Franklin County Public Library District's uh, 2020 tax rate. Uh, Executive Director Gene Roark, uh, Board President Natalie Wilkerson, and Board Treasurer Robert Kellerman are on. Welcome those of you that uh, are representing the, the library. We appreciate you. We appreciate the library. Uh, so uh, Executive Director Roark, if you, if you are going to present, we'll we leave, give you the Zoom right now. Uh, I think um, Treasurer Bob Kellerman is actually going to present for us this time. Okay. Welcome, Bob. Hello, Judge. How are you? We're great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I know you like this short and sweet. Um, the um, Franklin County Public Library District um, is here to present its uh, tax rates for 2020. And um, we voted to take the compensating rate uh, which is 8.46 for $100 of assessed value of real property and uh, 9.56 cents for $100 assessed valuation of personal property. Um, as I said, those are the compensating rates. Both of those rates ended up being uh, lower than uh, the 2019 rates, uh, just for your information. And of course, the vehicle uh, rate is set by the state at 4.9 cents per uh, 100. So uh, that's our report. Be glad to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, are there any questions? Okay, seeing no questions, thank you all. We appreciate it and 
And God bless what you do for our community the li with the library. It is awesome. We're so proud of the Paul Sawyer Library. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh-huh. The, uh, the uh, next item on the agenda is the Franklin County Extension District Board 2019-2020 tax rate. Keenan Bishop, are you on? Uh, yes, sir. I am, Judge. Yes, sir. Thank you, Keenan, for being here. Certainly. Um, I'll be short and sweet, too. On August 18th, the Extension District Board met and voted to also take the compensating rate, which uh, for real property, <clears throat> excuse me, is 1.681. For personal property is 2.6963 and motor vehicle is always set at 1.0. Okay. Any questions for our uh, county extension office, or extension district, sorry, or Keenan? Seeing none, Keenan, thank you. And once again, we thank you for how you lead our community so well from the, with the extension office and what it does for everybody in our community. Thank you, happy to. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is a, a tourism update from Robin Antonucci. Welcome, Robin, and we love the flowers that uh, that are in your backyard. You're on mute, Robin. So sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thank you for having me, and hello, everybody. It's great to see you, even, uh, even if it's through a computer screen. Um, I just wanted to take a few minutes to update you on the status of uh, tourism in our county uh, since we last, I think it's been six months since I last saw all of you in person. Um, our office is open. Uh, we had closed it to the public in March. We reopened it in uh, on August 3rd. In May, we furloughed the staff to save cash uh, because of the dramatic hit to the tourism industry in general. Uh, uh, to, you know, just to be able to go on longer. Um, but we brought the staff back on August 3rd and we're open, uh, you know, sort of business as close to normal as we can get it. Um, most of our attractions have reopened, some of those in early June, some of those in early July. Um, and our restaurants and shops are largely open as well, albeit, you know, curbside delivery and that sort of thing. It is turning out to be a very good year for our outdoor and in particular our county attractions, the Salado Wildlife Education Center, West Six Farm, Josephine Sculpture Park, and Canoe Kentucky are all doing a bang up business, having lots of visitation. Um, so as you would probably know by now that, you know, outside and outdoor venues are a win during the COVID situation. So we're we're grateful for that and happy that we have that to offer. Um, in terms of our visitors, uh, that has, has really taken a hit uh, back in March and in April, our occupancy in our hotels countywide was in the single digits. That's slowly rising, um, uh, but still, significantly less than where it should be for this point in, in the year. Um, we have, I've been monitor, I've been coming into the office every day throughout the whole thing uh, and, you know, sort of monitoring the foot traffic. And really since, since June through today, we've only had about a, a, about 200 people walk in the office in a normal year. It'd be at least twice that. Um, so, it, you know, it's just indicative of the situation. Um, on the bright side, uh, we are getting a lot of requests for information. We're fulfilling a lot of leads from that are generated through uh, inquiries on our website and on the state tourism website. We've sent out in June alone over a thousand uh, requests for information on attractions and, and visitor-centric things in our county. Um, Overall, we had estimated in quarter two, the quarter that ended June 30th, our uh, transient tax revenue would be down 90%. Um, it was only down 71%. Well, that's not great. It's better than 90, so I'm going with it. I'm taking that as a win. <laughs> um, 
what we what I'm seeing though is that the the impacts of this are back in March and April we thought oh well you know by September things are going to be back to normal well you all know that's not quite happening so our long term impacts are significant um, and we're we're monitoring things very very closely I hope we don't have to get into a furlough situation again um, we're just monitoring the cash literally every single week to see see where we're at we've cut all kinds of extraneous, not that we had a lot of extraneous, but a lot of outside uh, expenditures. We're doing uh, all of our advertising in-house digitally and through social media. We're not doing anything in print. Um, and so that has cut some costs and we're just trying to, you know, stay afloat basically. Um, most of our group bookings that we had in 2020 and early 2021 have rescheduled as opposed to canceling. Uh, so that's positive, they want to come back. Um, and it's just a matter of when they uh, you know, feel safe. We're starting to put some information out there in, in partnership with the state on travel safe and put some things on our website and social media that you know, Frankfurt is safe, Frankfurt is uh, small uh, and, and uh, we are following protocols and ensuring that our guests uh, uh, are safe and as safe as they can be. Um, some uh, relative to the hotels, uh, good news for them, uh, KSU brought back quite a number of students and because of the social distancing, they ran out of dormitory space on campus. So they are occupying a large percentage of the downtown Capitol Plaza Hotel as well as the Holiday Inn Express on the west side and the Best Western on the east side. Um, while that will not generate revenue for us because it's longer than a, a 90 day stay, uh, it is giving those hotels needed revenue and so we're very supportive of that. Um, we did, during the course of, of the last few months, we did, uh, migrate the Frankfurt Public Art Tour into the visitfrankfurt.com website. Uh, and we have added murals and sculptures. Uh, and you may have seen the mural going up on the side of Nitro, uh, which will be done uh, probably today with the rains coming in. So there are some positive things happening. Uh, people are wandering out and about looking at the art and as I said, the outdoor activities. So, um, that's pretty much where we're at. <laughs> uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to, I'd love to answer them for you. I'll start, uh, Robin. Um, what kind of impact has the Derby had on our hotels in, in uh, Frankfurt, Franklin County? And, and we get, this is not going to be a, a regular Derby. Correct. Without any fans, uh, it is impacting our hotels. Uh, normally, we would get some bookings oftentimes from state government uh, activities surrounding the Derby. Um, and now with no fan, we also would get spillover from Louisville this direction. Uh, of course, all of that has been canceled. Um, KSU, when they announced the lack of fall sports, all of those homecoming reservations got canceled. So, I mean, the impact on the hotel industry, both in our county, statewide, all over the world is, is unbelievable. Uh, the state uh, was e has estimated, um, I think, uh, I can't even, the numbers are staggering, but you know, just a 75% loss through, uh, estimated for the year um, statewide. And uh, you know, our numbers showing a 70% drop are, are trending that way. So um, they are looking at, uh, recovery beginning sometime in 21, but again, that's dependent on what happens with this virus. And, uh, you know, people just aren't traveling. They're just not comfortable. Last but not least of my questions, uh, um, Robin, I saw, I think it was maybe two days ago on the TV that Buffalo Trace was advertising that they're opening their, the uh, tours back up. Buffalo Trace reopened on July 1st. They have completely redone their protocols and procedures for their tours. They're doing a great job, excellent. Um, they 
you come in their parking area, they tell you where to park, you go through a temperature check, uh, a screening process, then you enter the visitor center, which has been completely redone. It's probably five times the size of what you might have seen prior to, uh, prior to them closing in March. Um, they take your name, email address, and phone number. Um, they monitor the numbers of people in the building at any one time. Each tour only has eight people, whereas before the tours were having up to 40 people. Um, they're changed their hours. They're, they're no longer open on Sundays. They're open from 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. The last tour is at 3 p.m. Um, the first week of July, they had 3,000 people. Uh, I've been going over there every week. They're, people are traveling for bourbon. There are people traveling for bourbon. Um, I do think that, that, you know, some of the trends that we've seen and, and data that the state has provided that you know, people are traveling, spending that time overnight with family or friends. Um, I think the Airbnb business has has risen some uh, because it's a little more isolating and people may feel safer in locations like that. Very good. You put a smile on Squire Tracy's face when you said people are traveling for bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I should mention all of our four distilleries uh, are open. Um, now, Castle and Key is not open for tours. Their public grounds area with their garden and so on is open. Uh, and they, they've got a little walk up bar where you can get a cocktail that is open. But in terms of like a distillery tour, they have not reopened those yet. Um, Three Boys Farm is open and um, uh, Glens Creek Distilling is also open and they're, they're giving tours. Any, any other questions for Robin? Squire Muller. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Robin. Hey, I appreciate you being proactive and um, you know, doing the furloughing and getting through everything. I had a question. How many Airbnbs do we have in Frankfort and Franklin County now? Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, best I can estimate, about 60. Um, they go on and off the site and because of the way Airbnb manages things uh, and the way the owners uh, you know, can sell their property or take it off the market for sale, so to speak, it's hard to sort of track that. But over time, I, I keep track of it. I try to watch it. I think there's about 60, but that doesn't mean that you know, today, if you went to Airbnb, you would see 60 of them because some of them might have been taken off the market because the owner's on vacation or something like that. But uh, as near as I can tell, there are uh, about 60 uh, in Frankfort and Franklin County combined. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Squire Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Judge and Robin. Again, thank you for joining us. Um, sure. You you mentioned uh, the seventy one percent reduction in the transient room tax. Can you tell yeah. us if, if that is a on a calendar year or is that starting in June on the fiscal year, or did that end the last fiscal year? I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, let me let me go back to that when I okay. might have misspoken. The 71% drop in transient room tax is for a quarter, April, May, and June of 2020. And that's 71% less than we got April, May, and June of 2019. So I, I don't, you know, that was the first quarter when I had COVID data and I could compare it to something. Um, so, that was the impact where we were full in the COVID situation all of April, all of May, all of June. When I look at what I collected, what we collected, both city and county in 2019, um, it was 120 some thousand dollars. And uh, what I collect, what we collected in 2020, checks I receive in August of the year uh, it was about thirty, thirty-three, or thirty-four thousand dollars. Thank you, okay. uh, Squire Tracy. 
Thanks, Judge. Um, thanks, Robin, for, sure. for joining us tonight. Just a um, couple, just a quick question. Over the last couple of weeks, I've noticed uh, neighboring communities touting tourism and local businesses, the success of them. Can you touch on what, uh, I guess, Frankfurt and Franklin County Tourism is doing to be proactive in letting people know, getting the word out that Frankfurt and Franklin County is open for business? We're, we're doing that primarily through social media. Uh, we've been working very closely through all of this with both the Chamber and DFI in getting the, the messaging out. At the beginning of the pandemic, we spent a huge effort uh, on social media to uh, let people know, you know, what was open for curbside food and that kind of thing. Um, and, and similarly with the, with the shops. And we, uh, through social media, we monitor really most of uh, a period of time every day, posts from our attractions, restaurants and shops and share those or, or boost those posts to try to keep that word out. We're also through the digital uh, marketing, um, you know, driving people to our website where we keep, uh, you know, current listings of what is open and what, what's going on with uh, attractions, shops and restaurants and that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. Just one more quick question. Yeah. Um, with that being said, how is that different than you, you all used to, to do it or how it used to be done? We always did that to a certain degree, but I would say from the social media standpoint and the focus locally, we have amped that up some because we needed to get the word out in our, whether it's a visitor or someone local, <laughs> they needed to know that. The following we have on social media has grown over the years and that's comprised of people both locally and that have visited our community um, so, you know, we've, we've really just put a more, a bigger emphasis on, you know, local businesses that are open or that's what we're trying to do instead of more general marketing saying, you know, come to Frankfurt. The other thing I would note on that is that, uh, there was emphasis in, in the past on events. Well, we don't have any events. So, um, the energy of, of marketing those events has shifted to, you know, uh, St. Clair is closed on Friday nights, come on down, or so-and-so is doing curbside, or so-and-so has their patio open, that kind of thing is what we're trying to do. Okay, thank you. Um, Squire Booth? Yes, well, I apologize for not being here earlier. You're here. <laughs> I look at the, uh, you know, the letter that comes with the packet and it said Friday, August 27th. Well, I just saw the Friday, you know, cause I didn't want it to be Thursday, <laughs> but I, I'm glad that it is and I'm here. I wanted to ask Robin if the um, B&Bs um, are paying taxes and does she have any idea of how much of our, how much of her income from taxes is due to the BNB usage? Um, I don't have a percentage in front of me of, of tax revenue from Airbnbs or, uh, well, I guess you probably mean Airbnbs. Um, some of them, uh, have pay their taxes consistently uh, when they are occupied and we are grateful for that. Um, that number has increased over the last year where there's an awareness, I think. I think there's been some challenge for some of these uh, owners to understand what, what the rules are on that regard. Um, then the complexity arises when you think, you know, there's an Airbnb out there and let's say it hasn't, it, it did not submit any tax dollars for that quarter. Uh, I have no way of knowing whether they, they booked any rooms that quarter. So they may not have sold any rooms or they may have sold rooms and not reported it. So it's, it's very 
it's a challenging problem and we're not alone. Many, many communities are, are facing this. And I've, I've talked with Susan about it. I've talked to uh, Lee and also the folks at the city. Um, we're trying to find a way to kind of solve that. Um, but it's a little bit challenging because uh, it's possible they're, they didn't book rooms and therefore they had no tax collected or they did and they, they don't know the rules or they did and they're just saying, uh-uh, <laughs> it could be any one of those three. Thank you, that's all. In, anybody else? Robin, what does, what does the fall look like? What, how, um, I know we're not having events, but uh, lots of times we get uh, people coming in in the fall seeing any, any you know when I look I just I just ran through a report on our website um, today and some of our digital marketing uh, in July we had about 1500 people click through to our website from ads that we placed digitally um, of those 1500 about 1200 were related to bourbon one of our bourbon related pages and or attractions. Mm. So I'm going heavy on bourbon. September is national bourbon month. Um, I got to What can I say? That's what I got to do. The second highest one. There's three categories of, of high percentages, bourbon, kayaking and river tours, which thank you to the trace of Kentucky and canoe Kentucky. Uh, and then people look at our hotels page and they, they're looking at where to stay. So um, we uh, are in the, we are spending some money on digital ads and it's in those three categories. And we're just, I just went through uh, today to update those for our a fall campaign. And uh, so it's bourbon outdoors, uh, where to stay and just keep messaging, messaging, messaging. And um we are working, you know, with the state and getting advice from them on research that they've paid for. The, the, the market is within the state and, you know, immediately surrounding the state. And so we're not trying to necessarily uh, reach out to, you know, California or anything like that right now. We're focusing a little closer in because that's what the state research is showing people are doing. About a 300 mile radius. Well, thank goodness for our bourbon industry. We appreciate them. And thank goodness. We are grateful. Yes. yes. Very grateful. <laughs> if there are no other questions, Robin, thank you for uh, coming on. And once again, we love your backyard uh, with the flowers. Your backyard too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is authorization for the approval of minutes from a regular meeting of August 7th. Are there any questions about those minutes at this time? Seeing none, the next item is, is uh, uh, some informational news and some sad news. We'll start with the informational. This is authorization to accept the Elkhorn Water District's audit report for the years ended December 31st, 2019 and 2018. And we, and we have Mike Dudgeon on the line. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Judge, appreciate it. Um, I have the, uh, I assume you all have a, a copy of the uh, independent auditor's report for years ended December 31, 2019 and 2018 for the Elkhorn Water District. And I'm pleased to uh, uh, let you know that uh, it was a clean audit. Everything came back. The uh, district is in a, uh, a very good uh, uh, place financially. Uh, some of the highlights uh, from, uh, 2019 compared to 2018, total assets were up approximately $6,000. Uh, water revenue was up approximately 30,000. Operating income was up uh, almost 25. Our total net position was up 17,000. Our cash position was up 18,000. Our total cash and uh, other investments on hand was 267,000. Our accounts payable were down five, uh, and uh, we still have the uh, uh, the USDA Rural Development Loan, uh, which uh, is now currently at about 166,000. 166, 
dollars, and that's due to be retired by 2034. Um, year to date, um, assets are are up uh, significantly. We're almost at a half a million dollars, uh, and um, uh, while our operating revenues and our income uh, is relatively uh, mirrors this time last year, our expenses are down significantly, about 11, almost 12%. So um, we're really proud of that. And uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yeah, let's go with Squire Muller first. Thank you, Judge. Uh, not a question, Michael, just a statement. I truly appreciate everything you've done for the Elkhorn Water District uh, over the last two years that you know I've been on this board. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much. Appreciate that, Squire. Thank you. Squire, tr Squire uh, Booth, you. I think that this is a miracle <laughs> that the revenue went up and the expenses went down. It must have uh, something to do with Elkhorn being a really good place. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I just would like to state that um, uh, my, my fellow board of commissioners and uh, the, uh, the staff, uh, our administrative staff, uh, our uh, financial consultants, our engineering consultants have all done a uh, a really good job over the last uh, several years to get us to to a good place, and uh, it wasn't it wasn't easy, but it was a uh, it was a uh, a good uh, uh, thing for the district, and, and we're very proud of that. But but all the, all that credit goes to to those folks that work very hard, and and frankly, the the support of the court has been uh, fantastic as well. In particular, Squire Muller, Squire Tracy. Uh, and uh, former magistrate uh, uh, Sturgeon uh, have been very supportive of the district. Uh, uh, obviously, our footprint lies within your two districts, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. Squire Tracy. Thanks, Judge. Um, yeah, and, and not a question, just a statement. Uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, thank you for everything. It's been an honor to work with you. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, years of service and hard work on the board. Uh, I'm gonna miss uh, answering those late calls <laughs> and, and seeing you there and yeah, so enjoy. And again, I appreciate everything, thank you. Thank you very much, appreciate that. Squire Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Judge. Mike, I just wanna echo those comments from my colleagues. Uh, uh, you know, you've had a lot of years of not not only dedicated to this, but you do a lot in this community um, and really do appreciate people like yourselves stepping up sometimes for in, in a quiet way to make things better across our community. And that's uh, true servant leadership. So I really do appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Mike, I, I, I too want to say thank you. Um, you've been excellent to work with. And uh, uh, I'm going to just share a moment. I remember you as a great athlete, uh, uh, a, a kid that, that was really skinny, but, uh, but a kid that could run very fast. And so on the football team, we always wanted to, to make sure that you got the ball and ran as fast as you could down the field. You, I, you think gonna, it, I think it was because I was scared more than anything else, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't like getting hit. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you were a good athlete, and I, uh, I, I remember you vividly as a young – young man and I'm so proud of where you are now and so proud of the work that you've done for the Elkhorn Water District and disappointed that you've moved and will no longer be on the board but I can see that uh, if that's your house or that's your shop one or the other in the background you've got you've got some you've got a lot of stuff to work on there there are that, that's that, this is our shop <laughs> so you got it looks looks great um, thank you again for your service, and it looks to me like we have a good uh, uh, person to come in. Won't be able to replace you, fill your shoes, but we'll be able to to keep it going, and we're proud of that. Well, thank you, Judge. I appreciate it. I appreciate uh, your support as well. Thank you. All right. With that, uh, uh, we will. We've heard the Water District's audit report, a great report, and we're going to miss Mike Dudgeon. 
Uh, the next item on the agenda is authorization, authorization to approve the appointment of Brad Gregory to replace Mike Dudgeon on the Elkhorn Water District. And Brad is a member of the uh, uh, my HMB engineering firm. Any questions on that? The next side. The, the next item on the agenda is authorization to approve a resolution permitting a tax credit of one half of 1% occupational tax license fee for new employees as part of an economic development project by the Recon Group Incorporated under the Kentucky Business Investment Program. And uh, uh, this is an interesting company that uh, uh, is in the old Bendix building and they, uh, um, they take uh, items that need could be need to be refurbished and uh, fix them up, and ended up selling them back to uh, uh, to companies. and And they're asked, they're going to. Uh, they have sixty people, and they're asked, they're at, they want to hire ninety more, and they're asking for the uh, tax abatement. Squire Sebastian, thank you, Judge. Um, I w I wanted to go back to tab four just for one quick second. I had raised my hand, and I think you had already. You were quicker than I was on that, quicker on the draw. I apologize, um, I did not see. In regard, that, that's okay, I, I completely understand. This format is uh, not as friendly as when we're all sitting in the same room. Mm -hmm. um, I do have just one quick question. Uh, on the, uh, there are some questions that each individual has to answer. And there's one specific question which says, uh, do you or a family, any family or business connections uh, make use of services provided by or connected with the board committee for which you are applying. And if you'll notice on this form, uh, there's another question that's similar and it says, if you have answered yes, if you could explain that, you know, we're not really sure uh, what the nature of this uh, answer for yes really boiled down to. Is it because they are customers of the water service or is it something else? So, I'm kind of asking the question along that line. Is it something that would merit us looking at adding just a little bit to this form that if you answer yes or no as appropriate to these four questions, if you could maybe give a little explanation, that might shed a little more light on it for us as magistrates as we review this material. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think there are lines there, and I guess we need to explain. Please comment. So we'll, I'll, Tamara, if you'll have uh, Andrew to work on that, we'll put that on there. Thank you. Okay. Um, now let's get back to item number five. Uh, our, everybody understand this uh, uh, program and what it does. It's it works with the state. The state won't do it unless the county does it. Uh, the state gives them a uh, a discount too. So. Uh, they want to expand. 90 more jobs would be great. Carl Muller. Thank you, Judge. Hey, quick question. Is this kind of standard uh, for larger companies? Like at what point do they apply for this as far as number of jobs? I'm just curious. Uh, in my years, uh, Lambert, you and I, uh, we've gone back many years. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty standard. Um, it's it's a way for them to uh, put that money back into their company if they're going to, especially if they're going to expand and they need the capital to, to uh, bring in machinery and stuff that or to expand their, their building. So yeah, it's pretty standard. Okay, we've been doing it. I, Lambert, once you say we've been doing it our whole time we've been on the court, or at least since two early two thousands. Ever since it, it came along, I don't think it was here for my first couple of years, but yeah, I think it become a uh, standard in the state, probably 2004 or five, something like that. We've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. I think we did one for somebody that was in this building, but they ended up uh, going away before it really came to fruition. Yeah, I, I, I believe we did. That's what I was going to remind the court that, that this is now regarding the occupants of this building. This is twice we've been on down that road, but different different entity yeah but it doesn't affect the current uh employees any any of the money come from them whatsoever it's just new hirees so it's a win-win i think yeah and it doesn't doesn't 
come into effect unless they do what they say they're going to do too. Right. Squire Blackburn. Yes, sir. Um, come on, muted here. On on uh, number one on the first page, it says this would be the credit given to the employees. Do the employees not pay that tax, or is it the employer that's not having to pay that credit? The the um, employer would not. The the um, the um, let's see, Rick. I think it's the um, they get they the um, employer does not pay it, I believe. Isn't that correct, Rick, how that works? John. They, they oh, pay, I'm sorry. State that employee again. pays it, but then it goes back to the company. Yeah. So. Okay. Squire Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Judge. I you know, I, I tried to do just a little bit of research here, and I, I noted that uh, or sourced some information that said that TRG was noted to expand its warehouse operation by adding 90 jobs over a four-year period, and that was supposed to begin in 2017. Um, do they provide any reports to let us know that that actually has happened? Uh, I don't think uh, uh, Terry's not on. Uh, I don't know if she got this in. This is it. Susan. I may be able to. Yeah. Okay. Susan, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, um, Squire Sebastian, there is a, a public website that you can monitor this activity on through the uh, Kentucky Financial Incentives Database, which is uh, uh, I don't know the exact website address, but you can you can Google it and it for those KBI incentives and you can drill it down by county and then you can see a whole list of what's uh, going on in Franklin County related to these, these projects of various types. They have a lot of different stages of activity. Uh, this they're in a preliminary approval status right now until they go to final approval or active, they may still be increasing their number of jobs and there there's all kinds of, um, monitoring, as the judge said, by the state that they are the they are the primary monitoring uh, agent. But you can get a you know a quick snapshot on that KBI uh, Cabinet for Economic Development website for these projects. Well, I, I tried to go on there and and do a little bit of research, and I couldn't find uh, where that had actually occurred over this period where. Uh, the court was told and others were told that that was going to happen and nor could I kind of identify what type of jobs uh, were in question to be added. Um, and I, I think uh, Squire Blackburn, I think asked for some information today, which we were provided. And it talks about an activation date and a job target and some other things. Um, uh, so just trying to figure out, uh, are currently employed there and uh, for those who are currently employed there uh, what type of jobs because certainly we want to support things that have good wages and support a, a family um, and then you know the, the range of wages is very important in that uh, if those are you know lower scale wages or or mid-range weight wages or, or higher wages and uh, you know if I mean I, I, I just think that that's important and I, I guess the way I understand it is the request before the court would reimburse to the company uh, not the employee I think uh, one half of one percent of the occupational tax paid by the employer or paid by the employees who are hired as a result of the expansion of the project that's the way I understood this so if and I think Squire uh, Moore mentioned this, and Judge, I think you did too. So if a current position is vacated, um, then a new employee comes in to fill that position, that situation would not be subject to this expansion, the way I understood uh, you all. Uh, I, I just want to understand that. And then, well, like I, you said, I'm sorry. Go ahead, I'll, please. I'll, a couple of comments. First of all, on the um, economic development website, when you look at the program, you will see that there 
estimating an average hourly wage of $14.10 per hour. That's about a $30,000 a year job if you're looking at a 40 hour work week. I, I'm sorry, I've got a sheet from uh, uh, the recon group uh, and it says 1650. Uh, if Terry was here, she would uh, remind us that when economic development does impact studies, they wrap in part of a benefit uh, okay. cost uh, into the compensation. Okay. Uh, so that wraps in a slight amount. But again, the, the, the KBI website will show the, the estimated average hourly wage at 1410. And that's excluding any benefits, which I'm not sure what they wrap in to, to, to count as a benefit. But that's that figure. The other thing I think Terry might remind us of if she were here is to say that uh, quite often these companies meet their economic um, in authorized incentive just through the state portion and that they do not necessarily have to pull the, you know, pull the trigger on the local money. But for the uh, for the deal to go through and to be approved that the county or the local uh, people should be supportive and sign on to it, which is what this um, action would be from fiscal court in support of basically the state saying they're going to do it. So there's no, there's no, you have to go on the assumption that you would have some liability, but just, just rough numbers, Squire Sebastian, based on 90 jobs, at a, about a $30,000 a year payroll and the county share of the 1% is about $26,000 a year. So we give up half about $13,000 a year and what it was it for 10 years. So that's a hundred and whatever, $130,000, whatever the number, I don't know what the number of years is of, of possible uh, economic investment return to the company, if that makes sense. So did, did you say that they do not have to utilize the local portion uh, of this if the, and the state requires a local portion before the state will participate? Depending on the profitability. I tried to do some reading on it. Uh, right, right. Well, what they're getting, what the, the benefit they're getting from the state or is I think a, a waiving their, a pro net profits tax. They're 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 basically their 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 income tax with the uh, with the state. So depending on how those figures work out, if they that's where they may meet that threshold with the state and not have to you know take any of the local money. And again, before the county does anything as far as rebating any monies to the company we have to receive some sort of notification from the state that the, that the company's in compliance with the program and the target number of jobs, et cetera, et cetera, as well as a, 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 a documentation from the, from the company uh, that, that they, you know, just on our local level to the extent that they still, they still file their payroll taxes on the local level because it's a rebate program. And so in, in with this being a rebate program, how do you rebate that once each month? Do you no. rebate it a quarter, on a quarterly basis? Do you rebate no. it? it? It depends on when the company files for it. Uh, it depends on when they, when they have final approval and they go active and then they would have to file for that rebate and demonstrate again, that they've met those state criteria. And that can, you know, that can take a, a be a delayed process. So well, going through the state, so they have to meet that state threshold first, and then they would uh, submit to the county that, uh, and, and the state would have that, when they would have that verification uh, documentation, or we have a reciprocal agreement with the, with the state to find out that information, to, to verify that information before we would rebate any money. We have yet to rebate any money uh, under a KBI program, although we do have several that are active and could be eligible. Okay, and we that do, was and and Squires again. You the this is now reported in our annual audits um, uh, as of I think uh, two two thousand and um, 
19 might have been the first year that we reported that liability. So we do quantify it based on the outside, you know, to the, the largest number, but we have not, you'll see in the financial notes on our audits that we have yet to, to turn any money back. Okay. Cause I, I had that as a, as a question as well. Have we, how many companies have, have we participated in this type of arrangement with and have we rebated any money? We have so, six or so, seven active, I believe, six or seven right now, Judge. I, um, I think you're right. But uh, but we have not returned any money. So, yes, we we do have some potential out there for, you know, some uh, returns. And, uh, and is it typical to have this 10-year window because, you know, well, that really binds two courts. I mean, if you look at it, so that binds our community for, you know, quite some time. Um, I'll just respond again from what I've heard Terry say, who's more familiar with the state side of it, that they go through a they go through a whole evaluation process with the company for what they need in order to come up with what the scenario is and the time frame and the terms in order to make the deal work. So, in order to make the deal work, they've come up with this 10 year time frame, and that's what's being um, submitted to the local uh, jurisdiction for support. Squire Blackburn. Squire Blackburn. Yeah, uh, Susan, it, you did state that the, the state does the monitoring, the, the monitoring and the compliance for the credit, and they also notify us, I guess you or our. Uh, tax folks do they also do a notification if they fall out of compliance well we haven't had we haven't had any that have been activated to to know that yet right susan that's correct and the state says it's all about the jobs and it is all about the jobs and that's where we don't have the numbers as you pointed out if you start with 30 jobs at the at the company which is what the website says now and they are going to add 90, then we have to be able to identify which ones are the base jobs and which ones are the new jobs, right? So there's some, you know, that that's where the that's where the reporting really relies on the state for them to identify those numbers and, and, and come about. Uh, we've worked with uh, uh, economic development uh, with asking questions about this program for several years now, and we've got a, a, a good, um, a, good contact people and they are they're you know always assuring us you know that it's it is about the jobs and, and we do want those jobs in Franklin County and agree with that and that they will be doing the monitoring and when they you know they will provide us the notification and the information we need in order to validate uh, any uh, local participation rebates on our end. Good thank you. All right okay Thank you, Susan. Thanks for your help. And uh, Susan, if uh, if you would, let's go to the next item, and that's the uh, Board of Assessments uh, Appeals, uh, uh, the uh, allowance. I think we split that with the uh, state, correct? That that money? Yeah. The state pays half, and we pay half for the uh, uh, daily rate of the three uh, ap appeals board members, right? Correct, correct. Okay, any questions on that? The appeals board, uh, Squire Blackburn. Yes, it says uh, they served one. Did, did these three uh, members, did they serve for one full day to take care of all the appeals? Yes. Or was it three separate days of appeals or? No, they, uh, they uh, I swore them in one day last week and it was all day long that they met with the with the appeals. I I'm don't glad it just took one day. You're, what did you usually, say? Usually so just I'm take glad one it day. just took one day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. The next item is authorization to declare property as surplus for the disposal for auction. Is Sheriff Choir on the on on the line? I'm there he there. is. Hey Sheriff. Before you get started, I want to say thank you for last weekend without going into any detail, but thank you for last weekend, your help. No problem. That's why we're here. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. You got some surplus property? 
yes, I've been promising for a long time we'd clean up our junkyard, as we all call it. So that's what we're trying to do here is get rid of the cars that aren't usable or they're just costing too much to keep running. And there's some other items in there that have been in the basement for a long time. I'm sure anybody that's been in there has probably tripped over to seeing the piles of junk around here. Now, will you be having the this? Uh, uh, you gonna put this on on the website to to get rid of it? How how are you gonna dispose? Yes, of it? Uh, Tambor and I are working to get it on Gov deals because of COVID. We're a little bit leery to have an in person auction this year. So I think what we're going to do is put it on there and have them sell it. Okay. We were looking at eBay as well as gov deal. So we kind of left it open and just said via auction. Uh, just uh, what sheriff, while you, I have you on, on here and you're, and we're talking about the same thing and uh, we'll, we'll get to Rick uh, as part of it at another time. But uh, I was at a bluegrass ad meeting uh, the other day and they're coming up with a website, which I think, would be great um and that website would be for surplus property for us to put on there to uh advertise for other counties uh in the 17 uh county region of for the bluegrass ad as well as other ad districts if you have surplus property in any of the government agencies and they were talking about other counties have police cars that they would like to put on there and get sold and other types of vehicles. So uh, this should be go, mo getting up by it, probably the first of October, uh, middle September sometime. And I want to get with uh, all the constitutional officers as well as uh, Mr. Sparks and the department heads and uh, talk with you, show you this new concept. I think it could be very helpful. Sounds good. Squire Moore. Uh, yeah, Sheriff, what are these values you have on the vehicles? Is that it? That's what Pam had asked us for for the county's inventory when we did it. Every year she'll say, give us a copy of your inventory and give us the value, and we just put a dollar amount of what we think the fair market value is. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Anybody else on that? Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Now we got uh, we got something else. Need a new car, I think, here. Well, I thought I would show some type of revenue before we asked for money to buy a car. But yes, sir, that's the one that was wrecked here a while back in the insurance claim. Okie dokie. Squire Muller. Okay, sorry. Yeah, can I ask maybe Susan a question? It looked like in the bills that we had already purchased it. Am, am I wrong? I guess we're supposed to, I guess, do we have to vote on it or is it already bought, it looked like? I can answer that if you'd uh, like. Tamara, you want to so answer? So we, what we did is we went ahead and obtained an invoice so that we could get authorization to purchase it and then also get the authorization to pay it because um, they do have one in stock that he could take possession of should you all uh, approve this. Instead okay. of waiting until for three weeks, um, the dealers usually like to have their check in hand and. Chris could, or a sheriff could swap it out at the same time. So we went ahead and, and did both. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Anybody, anybody else? Squire Tracy. Thanks, Judge. Um, sheriff, just one quick question. Does this price include the uh, the outfitting with the, um, the lights and, and so forth? No, sir. Um, the, I think there was... The insurance check, which y'all have in your file, I know Tamara attached it, was thirty six seven seven eight forty eight, And then when you take the price of the new Tahoe, it's thirty seven four four six forty. That costs you $667.92 about a car. The upfitting will be paying for. I knew that with COVID and everything, I wasn't going to ask for another 10 grand from the court at this time. So what we can take out of the truck that was uh, totaled, we're going to put in there, and then we'll just pay the rest out of our vehicle upfitting line, which is under law enforcement equipment. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else? Seeing none. Sheriff, thank you. Appreciate appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Right. Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, our jailer, Mr. Bonner. 
We've had an authorization to amend the jail's policy and procedures manual. Yes, sir. Um, throughout the year, I've, I've tasked um, Chief Mazacone to go through our policy and procedures and make some updates. And there's one that we need to, to do tonight and we'll do some more throughout the future. So I'm going to turn it over to Chief Mazacone. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, we updated our, our policy in accordance with state law. We added gender identity as a protected class. I think the court's already done that for the administrative code. We're just making sure we're in compliance. Okay. Gender under harassment protects civil rights. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Thank you for your work on that, Rich. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jailer Bono, we got another item. Uh, we we did. Authorization to approve a personal service contract with the Summerhill Group to assist Franklin County prepare, submit a proposal to the U.S. Marshal Service and negotiate a new per diem rate for intergovernmental agency agreement. We, we like that idea of new per diem rate, especially if it's yeah. going to be higher. Right, Mr. Logan? Ed, Ed's talking, nobody's listening. I understand why, why he's doing that. Um, first of all, hello, court. Thank you all for having us tonight. Um, we've got some updates too later to give you all. But this one here was um, last year, Summer Real Group um, contacted us and wanted to renegotiate the per diem for federal inmates. And they wanted an upfront fee. And I just wasn't willing to do that with the climate we were in. Well, Mr. Summerall has um, redone his his fee to help us out where it's a win-win. The contract with the federal um, inmates right now is at $30 per inmate, and we try to stay around 20. We've been a little under that. Today, we're at 22. Um, and he's hoping to get our rate up to from $30 to $50. That's $20 a day. And my quick math is at 20 inmates that could raise our revenue up $150,000 a year and hopefully get more inmates. Um, I've asked Mr. Summerall to come on here today because he knows this inside and out, the contract with the, the federal government, he's done it for um, four or five jails in the state and all throughout the, the country, it's, it's even more than that. Um, Mr. Logan is a longtime friend of mine and he called and, and contacted me and, and advised that Mr. Summerall had changed his, his rate. Basically, I'll let him explain that to you, but he will take a fee from the additional per diem we get throughout a few months um, for payment instead of an, an upright cash fee. Um, but I think this is a win-win. I advised you all months ago that I would be out looking for revenue. This is a great way to get us for revenue. And, and the way the state inmate th um, numbers are going, this could be a very good way to make up for the loss of state inmates and the, the term it's going to take to get state inmates back. This could very well make up upwards of $150,000 to $200,000 a year in the revenue. So we're trying to make more revenue for you all. Um, Ed, do you have anything to comment on that? I see you on here now. Yeah. The uh, the only thing I've got is that obviously if the rate doesn't get increased, there is no fee that's due to the summer row group. So there's no risk to the fiscal court in doing this. Awesome. So I, I, to, this, this is Joe Summerall. Um, the jailer has been uh, kind to start with us uh, call data ahead of time. And uh, we've already started to look at what the unit would be. Um, we are projecting a final rate. Okay. That uh, sounds good. I, I love the idea of a possibility of making some more money. I think it's great, Jake. We're trying, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we got several hands up for questions. Uh, Squire Muller. Thank you, Judge. I was wondering if the county attorney could speak on this uh, for us, please. Uh, don't see the county attorney for the at the moment. Mm. Um, I'm just breaking. 
<laughs> what what Sorry, would you perhaps what would you like me like to expound on? Uh, Squire Muller, his question is, what do you want him to expand on? Well, I, I just, I mean, uh, are we good with this, Rick? I, I just, just want your advice here. If, if you choose to do it, it's, it's a good thing of its kind. It's a professional services consulting type contract um, from a consultant who contacted the jail that you heard the terms, you heard, uh, you heard you heard what the what the deal is there's nothing there's nothing wrong with it if you choose to do it just up to you if you choose to do it or not okay. I, 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 I have no i can't vouch for any of the monies any of the so i don't want to use profits when you're talking about making money from caging people and housing people but um for for revenue purposes they've got to be housed somewhere and if if i guess the option is if you can find a way to get paid more for the same services I guess that's a that's a plus, but it's it's up to you all at this point. There's it's a good thing of its kind, Squire. That's all I can say about it. Okay, thank you, Rick. Squire Blackburn. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's a great thing. I like uh, the point where we will make more money, and I understand that the consultant reached out to us. I kind of find it puzzling why we've waited 32 years to try to renegotiate this contract. Me too, you Squire. You may want to ask that of the about 118 other counties in front in Kentucky. Because I've, I've noticed on your on your your paperwork, we have you, you've Mr. Summerall's group has represented a couple jails within five years and renegotiated again. So, and I looked at the numbers; ours looked like to be like the lowest there. So, I think it's past due, and I'm all for it. Squire Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Judge. And uh, Jay Labrana, I just want to uh, applaud the jail staff uh, for initiating an initiative uh, to increase the per diem rate uh, above what we have, the current $30 rate. Um, so uh, I, I noticed in our packet, the financial implication is NA, and I understand because we're looking at a, a portion of this being paid if if we are deemed eligible to participate and raise that rate, that's going to come off to the Summerhill group. So can can someone talk to the talk to us a little bit about the payment calculation part? Is it similar to other contracts noted in the proposal? Because Jay LeBron, I really appreciate you you saying you know we didn't want to get into a situation where we're paying up front for something uh so i i just kind of wanted to to understand and how frequently that's used uh in the in contracts that are relative to the correctional industry for something like this and then i have just a couple of other questions that are pretty minor sure i'm gonna let um I'm going to answer that, and if I if, if something's not correct, I'll let Mr. Um, Summer correct me. My understanding is we can go from a, a twenty a twelve month contract all the way up to a forty eight month contract. It just depends on the negotiation there that we'll do, and then his um, the fee for Summerill will come out in the first three months of of the contract going through, and it will be the difference of what we are now and what we agree upon so just to use numbers we're at 30 dollars now and if we get 50 dollars, he'll get 20 dollars per inmate for three months as his payment and then after that whatever term we have is, is the revenue we will process for the, the remainder of that term mr summer am i correct there we may have lost i don't know what the I don't know whether Joe is on, but yes, you are correct. It's it's only on the increase. It's not anything that the uh, county is already getting. Right. Uh, and I understood that. And I appreciate that uh, because in that compensation clause, the proposal lists a 90 day calculation time frame, but it's not specific that it is the first three months, the first 90 days or just any. I, 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 I did want to add and clarify that just to see if it was a floating 90 days or if it's automatically the first 90 days. And then again, I've got just a couple more questions. It's automatic. It's um, the first 90 this days. Is, this is okay. Thank you. 
And um, this is the summer. I, I apologize. I didn't my... hear his answer. What was that? And it is the first 90 days, and it's not due and payable until the county collects it. So there's there's no out paying by the county until the money's already paid to them. All right. Sebastian, if you'd hold on a second, Mr. Summerall came came on the line. Mr. Summerall, do you want to did you want to say something? Okay, I thought I heard him there. Okay. Squire Sebastian. Thank you, Thank you Judge. Um and and Jay Lebron, does Franklin County currently have a transport rate? Um, I noted in this contract and several of the other uh, in communities that were listed and jail facilities that were listed also had a transport rate. Not only did it increase this per diem rate, but it increased their transport rate. I just wondered if that was something that we considered as well to include as part of this, or if that's something that you're thinking about as a second stage uh, of this. We currently have that now. Um, I believe it's $15 at two deputies. Um, you have to transport two deputies um, at all times with federal. Um, and then that is negotiable in the contract. Um, plus mileage, I believe, um, is in there too. So yes, we have it now and I'd like to up it. Okay, thanks, because I, I didn't, I, if it's in there, I missed that somewhere that we wanted to increase that. I didn't see that. That didn't stand out in anywhere. So uh, are we looking at a set rate that we're wanting to increase that or? Um, I'll I'll confer to Mr. Summerall with that, but yeah, I would like to have a, an exact rate so we know what we're budgeting. Great, thank you. I, I, I would yeah, think that would be advantageous to us as well. Just, just keep us posted on what that is. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Squire Booth. Oh, well, I was just wondering, you know, they said that it's a win-win for everybody. And I wondered why it was a win-win for the Summerall <clears throat> um, Summerhill group. Sorry, mispronounced it. And um, I see that it's providing the same service for an increased amount, and that's what his his uh, advantage is. And to the jail, I don't see what the advantage is if you're receiving the same service that you would have, but you're just being nice to this man, I guess. <laughs> and somebody pays it. Summerhill, I guess. Uh, Squire Booth, I'm going to make it as simple as I can uh, to explain to you that um, in, in one year's time, if it, you were getting $30 for a, an inmate and you can get $50 for an inmate. So Mr. Summerhill will get for three months, he will get $20 per month. So that would be $60 then we will get from that time on nine times 20, which would be $180. So that's $180 more for the jail. That's why it's a, a win for the jail. Mr. Oh, okay. Summer Hills company gets some money and the jail gets more money. And we like Mr. Summerhill, but we're more interested in the jail getting more money. So that's just kind of about as simple as well. I, I can didn't realize that it was, uh, sorry, it's my fault. That no, limited sure. to uh, 90 days. Yeah. And uh, Councillor Logan told us it was the first 90 days. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Everybody got it? Any other questions? All right. Hey, Ed, it was good to see you, Mr. Summerhill. I, I, we tried to get you and tried, and uh, we, I know Mr. Bonnet and all of y'all will work this out and we look forward to having a great contract and hope longevity contract with you too. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, judge. Thank okay. you, Ed. Thank you, Joe. And everybody. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. uh, the uh, Miss Susan, the next item on the agenda is first reading of an ordinance relating to the 2020 Franklin County tax rates for real 
and personal property, aircraft, watercraft, non-commercial, and 2020 tax rates for motor vehicle and water watercraft. Uh, Susan, if you'll go over that, and then uh, if you wouldn't mind, and we will continue to reiterate the public hearing date. Uh, yes, Court. We received our certified assessment from the state and called the Finance Committee meeting uh, August 18th uh, to consider rates and additional revenue uh, to be generated from the real property tax. And the committee met and agreed to recommend a rate that would, um, and you, you should have received a spreadsheet that would be the same as last year for the real property tax rate. So no increase in the rate uh, by leaving the rate at the same in the proposal for, uh, for court that is higher than the compensating rate and any rate greater than the compensating rate does require a public hearing which is scheduled for September 8th. And then since this is a, uh, a hearing and a, an ordinance, it's my understanding, and we, we went through this process in prior years that we're recommending the, the, a given rate, if any rate at, at that recommended amount or less um, is, a, is um, chosen, then we still meet the criteria for the the public hearing and the, and the second reading. Uh, the rate that's being recommended would generate uh, about $236,000 additional revenue for fiscal year 21 uh, over the receipts that we had last year. The, uh, there is also calculated with the real property tax rate, a personal property tax rate, but because of the assessments and the uh, the nature of the assessments, the uh, personal property tax rate would actually go down regardless of what rate we pick. Even if we picked the 4% rate, the, the personal property tax rate will be going down. The uh, public notice for the for the hearing does identify certain specific uh, amounts and figures for, for comparison and revenues. Um, it's, it's, it's worthy to note that the sheriff does the tax collection and earns commission from the tax collection. And it's a, the largest part of the sheriff's fee revenues and the rate that we set would certainly uh, impact the sheriff's budget as well in meeting his projections. The, the only other comment, and then if we have, have questions I would make is that uh, the, the um, motor vehicle and the watercraft rates are, are, are set and they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't change. They're, they're, they're set uh, by, pretty much by continuation statute so if there's certain questions I'll be happy to go over those okay uh, Squire Booth Squire Booth Squire Booth can't hear you can't hear you I'll reaffirmation that all of the tax rates that we set for year fiscal year 21 are the same as they were for fiscal year 20. Is that what that you're is, saying? That's well, with, with the exception of the personal property tax rate, the personal property tax rate is based on a formula that's derived from the real property tax rate that you set. So once you make that determination then that um, that provides the the um, the rate the personal property tax rate uh, maximum that you can that you can adopt so that that's what I was referring to that that would change regardless of what rate the fiscal court oh is that a new law or why is it different no no it is uh, it is it's it's a calculation 
uh, formula calculation that we make every single year. It's just that this, because of the assessments and the basically the, when, as you probably have heard over the years, typically, you know, there's this inverse relationship between uh, assessments and rates. If the assessments go up, then the rate comes down. So uh, we'll just we'll just call a bourbon a bourbon. Uh, the distilleries obviously are the, uh, where the impact is under the personal property that where the assessment uh, uh, is going up, and so that's put that that um, that change that formula to make that personal property uh, tax rate come down. Oh well, it is not going up, so I guess that we're. Okay with that. Oh, uh, uh, any other questions? Squire Moore? Uh, yeah, Susan, uh, if, if we took less than what we took last year, but still more than the compensating rate, would we still have to have a hearing? Yes. So if we took the compensating rate, would we have to have a hearing? No, but that would be a big mistake. I, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Thank you. Squire Blackburn. Susan, you just mentioned it would be a big mistake. I know in the paper the other day, it mentioned that the fiscal court was raising taxes, um, and that's just not true. It's so not true. Could, could you explain uh, to us and the, the public uh, how it would be a mistake? I'm not sure what the newspaper reported about raising taxes. What was that about? They just said we were going to raise the taxes. I don't have it in front of me, but anyway. Well, uh, first of all, there will be a public hearing on September 8th, and we can go into much greater detail at that time to uh, address public concerns and to provide some information. But in general, I'll uh, just briefly uh, for the context of this meeting, as I suggested, by leaving the rate the same, we would add about $236,000 more dollars than last year for real property taxes. I'll suggest to court that if you look at your expenditure side, uh, several budget lines and budget areas, in particular, our fire service, you'll note that we have a, that dollar increase in that service every single year or more in that one service area. If you look at uh, our law enforcement area of service, fiscal court covers benefits for and to the tune of uh, uh, Social Security and Medicare, as well as hazardous duty retirement for law enforcement officers for the county, for a countywide service. And that is over a $600,000 bill and has grown by, in the last uh, four years, about 56%. The, those are just two general samples of why our community services require an investment by the taxpayers that are, that are utilizing them for the health and welfare and safety of our community. And the only local option that counties really have for revenue and for some revenue control in an area where we have so much uncertainty right now about our revenue and have been questioned about, about you know, where what's the future going to be like? This is the one opportunity for fiscal court to 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 show a commitment for and and confidence in its investment in the community for services by setting a rate that does not increase uh, a, a large majority of, of the, the people's taxes because it's the same rate as last year. So unless your assessment is increased, the amount you pay to the county would not increase. Squire Moore? Well, the, that is what I was wanting to say or ask a hundred thousand dollar home is going to have the exact same tax paid on it as it did last year, right? 
unless yes. it was, has been reassessed by the PVA. Right. Well, that's my district judge. <laughs> <laughs> and mine too. <laughs> that's why I said that. And mine too. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but yes, actually for three years in a row, the tax rate has been, if, if we go with this, we'll be 18.70. So three years in a row, we have not raised taxes. But our revenue has gone up because we've gr grown. And right. that's what we all have been saying. We have got to grow. And when we grow, our tax rate is, is going to change. Our monies are going to change. Okay, I'm, I'll read this uh, because it's interesting that they said we raise taxes. We, uh, actually, we got more revenue, and then we'll explain it. It said the tax rate levied last year was 18.70 cents per $100 and produce revenues in the amount of $6,041,461. This year's compensating rate is 18.1 cents per $100 and will produce revenues in the amount of $6,104,016. The Franklin County Fiscal Court proposes a tax rate of 18.70 cents per $100 which will produce a total revenue of $6,306,359. So the revenue is going up, and I guess that's where some people may infer that, that uh, taxes are going up, but they are not. Three years in a row, and I think that's something that you can be proud of, that you can say for three years in a row, the tax rate has stayed the same. Judge, I think it was a headline that actually stated the the court was raising taxes Okay. Uh, of that article. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, but if you don't mind, just ask to Susan again, Susan, if the rate stays the same as, as what we currently have, that is considered staying the same, correct? It's not raising taxes. Would you please make sure that that's clear? The, the tax rate that is being proposed is the exact same rate as last year. So it's not a tax rate increase. It is not a tax rate increase for the county tax rolls. We hear you, Susan. Yeah, Squire Tracy has it. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm gonna read this. Uh, and then Andrew, I, I'm hoping that you, you will put this out on our website. So we are having a uh, public hearing on September the 8th at five o'clock, and it will be a Zoom meeting, but you will also be able to write in comments. So listen to this, the public and you all that are on Zoom here uh, to what I'm about to say. If you want to video teleconference, you contact Andrew Tippett, Internet and Technology Coordinator by email at a tippett, T-I-P-P-E-T-T -T -E -T -T, at franklincountyky.com to obtain the VTC login information necessary to participate. Or if you want to write, have any, send written comments, these will be read aloud during the public hearing and may be submitted by email to a tippet at franklincountyky.com or by U.S. mail to Franklin County Fiscal Court Attention, 2020 proposed tax rate public hearing, 321 West Main Street, Frankfurt. Written comments must be received in the office no later than 5 p.m. on September the 8th, 2020. Andrew, please make sure that is posted uh, so people can see that. Squire Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, I just wanted to also uh, have Susan reiterate that it's, it is the same rate as last year. It is the same rate as the year before. That's correct. So I, I just want to make sure that that is out there because I think someone, uh, when I, someone asked me to come look at an issue and the first thing they said was, well, the paper said you all are raising taxes. I had to explain it in somebody's yard that that was incorrect. So I am hopeful that I think every magistrate now and the judge and the treasurer have hit on this is not a tax increase. Hopefully someone will get that message that that is the case. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, Susan, now let's talk about a resolution relating to the 2020 Franklin County tax rates for insurance capital and bank deposits. Uh, yes, Judge. The bank deposit tax rate is the same uh, as it has been for the 20 plus years that I'm familiar with the history of that rate. We budget for that uh, and brings in around, uh, let's see, I think we budget $180,000. It's based on how much money is uh, deposited at our local banks and, it, and it's a rate. And this is again, this is a state, a state rate and the county adopts the implementation of it. And we have a history of impl implementing that. The insurance uh, capital tax, again, is a state rate that is allowed for the county to impose. And we have uh, a record of imposing that tax that um, the local um, life insurance company that is domiciled in Franklin County. We had a rate of 0.10% um, last year. The maximum rate is 0.15%. And we had a, a lengthy discussion, I think last year about the history of that rate and that we would move towards um, capitalizing on that, that opportunity for local revenue. And so I've, uh, it's being promoted as the maximum state allowed rate of 0.15%, uh, which would generate um, around $110,000 worth of revenue. Okay, discussion? All right, Susan. Uh, no, Squire Booth. Squire Booth. It's a comment. Okay. I think that is reasonable, and I think we should do it. All right. See nobody else. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much. Let's go to the next item. And the next item, uh, John, it seems like we've been talking about this for a while, this this bridge over Greg, designed for Gregory Woods. Um, you want to talk about that, providing engineering service for DLZ to provide the engineering service? Yeah, sure. This is one of our bridges on our priority list that we did the uh, year before last, I believe. And I'm going to speed this one up as fast as we can. This is kind of a unique deal. It's a 20-ton bridge. And two miles down the road, I got a 26 ton bridge. So the people in the middle are having trouble getting rock or concrete or anything. So they're kind of boxed in. So we need to go ahead and get this rolling, uh, get some design work done. I've got some rough estimates. Uh, I'm gonna try to go after some state money, but uh, if we go ahead and get the paperwork done and try to get it permitted and all that and hopefully maybe by this time next year we can have this thing in motion and get it done sounds good i know you've been wanting to get it done for a while squire uh, tracy out, out in his area i know he's uh, talked about it too squire tracy do you want to say anything Yeah, we've uh, uh, John and I've already picked out the next one in District Four that we're going to go after. So yeah, we need to go ahead and get this one finished up so we can move on to the next one. Yeah, thank you, Judge. Just remember that all the managers have to vote for it. So <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. Any any more discussion on uh, on the bridge uh, over Gregory, Gregory Woods? So the Gregory uh, Woods. Yes, Judge. I'd like to say something, uh, John. We. If you remember, we got some federal money on Crab Orchard Bridge, so you might want to look that way too. Yeah, I'll check. We'll see what we can find. Don't hesitate to talk with Ann Northcutt too, John. 
Okay, uh, the next item is authorization to approve a temporary salary increase to the chief electrical inspector while serving in dual capacity and performing inspections for the city of Frankfurt. And uh, Robert, I know you've, you've got a lot of information to give out here, but I'm, I'm gonna make it real simple. Uh, this is huge. It, it, we're, uh, the city is now, until we can get somebody hired, and, and Robert, I ask you to talk about that, but we're working towards that. The city is actually now paying half of, uh, of uh, Mel Trivet's salary uh, at this point in time uh, to do to do city and county work. So we're we're coming we're we're coming out ahead, uh, and and that's all. It, it's a as somebody said earlier, it's a win win, and uh, so it seems like a pretty good deal here. Robert, are you on the line? Go. Yes, sir. I'm sure there's a million questions, and I know you've got a lot of information. Thank you, Judge. Good evening, Court. Um, as of August 1st, <clears throat> the electrical inspector position became vacant. Uh, the county has two inspector positions in the electric division um, on the books. So as a result um, of having only one inspector, that employee is uh, needed to provide inspection action services for both the county and the unincorporated areas and under contract to the city. Um, so that employee has been um, really on the move. And um, uh, the administration has already submitted the advertisement and, and it was published in last weekend's state journal uh, requesting applications for uh, an electrical inspector um, and then the, 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 I think we were running that ad for two weeks. Uh, what I'm requesting this evening is a temporary uh, compensation of the chief electrical inspector while he performs the inspection duties for both the county and the city. Um, I would, I'm requesting that, that, that the court consider a temporary increase until such time that the electrical inspector position is filled. I am recommending um, a range between five and seven dollars per hour for that individual. And the city would pay half of that. Is that correct, Robert? That is correct. Per the contract, the city, regardless of, of which, you know, and well, in this case, we only have one electrical inspector. So the way the contract reads, then the city pays half the salary and benefits of the inspector. So in this case, um, until we hire another electrical inspector, the city is Will, will be required to pay half the salary and benefits of, of, in this case, our chief electrical inspector. Prior to the agenda abstract going out, I did discuss this proposal with the uh, city uh, planning and community development director, Eric Cockley, who then consulted with the city manager. They did not voice an objection to this. I see that uh, city manager Russell is on our meeting tonight, uh, uh, but, the employee is, is, has been a, a you know, 20 plus year employee with the county with, with a wonderful performance record, attendance record, uh, uh, exceptional certification record. And I uh, would hope that the county, the fiscal court would consider this temporary increase uh, during this time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Squire Blackburn? Yes, uh, where are we stand on the uh, renegotiation of the contract that we have with the city? Judge, would you, would you like for me to address that, or would you like to discuss? Yeah, go go ahead, go ahead. I asked you and Eric to continue you to, to work on it from our, yes. from our first meeting. Yes. yes, thank you. So, so um, under um, uh, the city administration with Keith Parker as the city manager, we did have an initial meeting to discuss uh, the variables within the existing contract that were that were eligible for negotiation. And, you know, it basically boiled down to two issues in which the city at that time said, yes, we agree. There's, you know, we can, um, there, there's flexibility on our end for that. So um, both the city manager and the judge executive um, gave direction to both city and county planning directors to internally work out what we believe to be a, a fair and equitable arrangement for a revised contract, not only with the, the terms of the contract, but also to consider amendments to the electrical fee schedules for uh, both the city and the county. 
unfortunately, the city manager, Mr. Parker, um, is no longer with the city, so we will uh, forward and continue that effort along with uh, city manager Russell and Judge Wells. So we have begun the process, and, and the first meeting went very well. Uh, I might say before I, I call on you, uh, uh, Squire Blackburn, is that I gave them a goal uh, to see if they this can't be worked out, and we have a, a new contract as we hire and bring on as the new person starts to work whenever that may be. Hopefully, maybe the middle of uh, by the end of September or, or something along that. Squire Blackburn. Yeah, I have some I have some trepidation to bring on a new employee under the existing contract. So I'm glad that you're thinking of that. Also, is, is it my understanding that we are going to give a county employee a raise to do inspections for the city? Is that what this, it's what it sounds like? Uh, I, th uh, this, my request for this employee is a result of that individual performing the duties of two full-time employees. Not only his, the chief's inspector's requirements in the county, but the electrical inspector's requirements within the city. So yes. So wouldn't it be equitable to have the city compensate him for the city's part and us not increase his salary to do the city's part? Uh, well, well, that would require a renegotiation of the contract. Yeah, there we go. Um, that's what I'm shooting for. I, that's just where I'm at. I, I, I just want to be real frank about it. Um, I know the contract was originally written without variables that were solid and known. Uh, I think the term that it was written for was a little lengthy for not knowing the variables and planning for a renegotiation. So um where i'm at with that is uh i just got a problem giving a pay increase to do work for someone else uh well now wait a minute he's still doing work for the county uh, and we're paying him for that well we're only paying half his salary for it oh so he fell into the contract so That's we've swapped an employee for a contract that what another employee was doing is that correct? The way the contract is written, the contract is written that uh, an employee will do the city and the county, the city and the county. We only have one person. And so the city would, in, in doing that, the city would agree to pay half of the salary. And the so it looks like the city's getting us again. Um, I, see how you I, can I just want to be equitable. Can I, can I say something here? Yeah. Um, I don't, you may understand this, but I'm sure some people don't. Let's say our employee is making $20 an hour. We're going to pay him 10, well, and it's going to go to $30 an hour. We're, the county, the city is going to pay half of that salary. They're going to pay 15. We're going to pay 15. Yeah, I totally you. understand so that. Not, My point but, is, but, but we need some something people, to push this. People out there are thinking that that you're quibbling over him, us paying half of seven dollars, and and that's not the case. The point is, I'm not quibbling over this salary. I'm I'm trying to push something that I've been adamant about for eleven months, and uh, we've been at the mercy of the city for a contract that we uh, facilitate. And uh, I just I just don't think the county should be at the bad end of a contract every time we have one with the city. OK, OK, Robert, would you uh, and that's and I'm sorry you think that because um, the county is benefiting greatly from this. And uh, it's the I think it's is a win on both sides. So, Robert, go back to the beginning and uh, explain because I don't want the, this be written in, in such a negative tone that the truth should be known why we did this, Robert, and why the city did this. Okay, yeah, sir. I, I, I followed this from the beginning. I understand it. Um, well, the way you said it. explanation for the public and the other court members, that's fine. But I, I stand where I'm at, and, and it's pretty I, I black just, and white. I want people to understand what this is really 
what's really going on here. And both sides are, the city and the county are working together, helping businesses. And I mean helping businesses because the businesses are ex extremely excited about what we're doing. And Robert, would you please explain once again why we came, uh, how this came about? Yes, sir. Under City Manager Tim Zissoff, the county found themselves in a position in which uh, growth was such that uh, we felt there be a need for an additional part-time electrical inspector. The city was in a position in which they didn't feel as though they had the need for a full-time electrical inspector and were in agreement with hiring a part-time inspector. The difficulty in that for both jurisdictions was that uh, finding individuals qualified who would only work part-time. So um, the, the arrangement was based on the need for both the city and the county um, uh, and, and, and the equitable sharing of the cost of the salary and benefits for that employee to perform services not only for the city, but also to assist with the county uh, to provide a backup during vacations, illness, time off, things of that nature. So, uh, you know, when, when you only have one certified electrical inspector and the, that employee chooses to go out of town on vacation and a storm comes through your community, since not all electrical providers that service our county offer the waiver program, it run, you, we run the risk of individual homeowners not uh, being reconnected to the electric grid until such time an inspector uh, certifies that the repair work meets the electric code. So it, it puts, puts me at great anxiety um, and, and, a, and a hardship to the community. So by having a backup employee, it, uh, it provides a safeguard and, 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 and a service because the growth is in the county, not as much so in the city. In the past, this court has asked that I provide a comparison of, of inspection, uh, in individual inspections that have occurred. Um, I have an exhibit available tonight for, for a brief period within 2019 uh, where I could just pull an example together to show you. Uh, I would like to share that on the screen now, if I could. Uh, Mr. Tippett, will you, am I allowed to screen share? Yes, sir. So the perception has been that uh, the employee was performing, or the, the, the employee being shared was spending a majority of time in the city. Um, so this is a chart that is for May through August of 2019. And, and I'm working on getting the full year and then, and then the remainder of 2020. So blue represents city inspections, green represents county inspections. So these two charts or these two bar graphs are the same. They're just one's, a, one's an angled sort of thing and one's just straight on, depending on how, you know, what you see the best. But what this shows is that just purely based on the number of inspections performed, the county far exceeds that of the city. Now, with that being said, you cannot, or it's not appropriate to judge the activity of the inspector solely based on the quantity of inspections. The type of inspection and the time necessary is also extremely important. During this time, um, you know, the uh, you know, the city had some, some projects going on in the Franklin Square Shopping Center, in the old Kmart Shopping Center, um, and some other strip mall and uh, several other commercial um, projects that were happening. And so uh, through our permit software, the, uh, the inspectors note, and I just, I broke down the, the spreadsheet slightly. So it, in this case, I'm just showing you the difference between um, you know, a residential inspection in its location, a repair, a commercial project, um, uh, uh, temporary service for, for new construction and the like. But when you look at just the raw numbers, which you have to take with a grain of salt, the county far exceeds the number of inspections being performed 
than what occurs in the city. So our perceptions early were, were not correct, and I apologize, I didn't get this to you all sooner, but now we know all the inspections are in the county, the majority are, because that's where the growth occurs. Okay. Go ahead, Squire Blackburn. Can't hear you, Squire Blackburn. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, perception's key. Uh, the last time uh, I saw the numbers that you presented, the uh, employee that uh, left for a new position, 80% of his uh, inspections were in the city. And I know that you said, and it's true, the, the numbers don't paint the full picture as, as far as time spent at a job. Um, I just got off the phone today with uh, Woodford County. They have one inspector and it's not enough. Uh, he's in the National Guard. He had summer camp this uh, summer, summer training, um, sick days, uh, vacation days, things like that. They contracted out, they never miss a beat. Um, I don't like that we are at the mercy of having a part-time or shared employee for to put us in a position that, that we can't get inspections done. Um, I'm I'm really trying hard to figure out a way that we can get out of this, and uh, I just think there's a better way. Is all I'm saying. And and I, oh, told Squire, I can I can suggest to the court I can suggest to the court how to solve the problem because I remember how it came up. The court be willing and have the finances to hire an additional number of inspectors. The court went the easy cheap route and said, "Look, it's like when your friend says I like to go fishing. I'll buy a boat and you buy the motor." Well, now everybody's squabbling about whether who's using it more weekends and who's using it less. If you want to solve this problem, the city and the county be willing to invest the money to hire their full-time inspectors like really they should have done. But with the effort to save money, allocate resources between the two of them. And work together. Court, and work together. The court elected a different route. It's an easy solve. Pay people what they're worth be willing to hire full time and quit nickel and diamond again, because that's what you're going to get is another split series of employees and split dynamics between two different jurisdictions trying to do the same job, making it through the day. It's an easy solve, but you got to be willing to pay for it. The money wasn't there. I don't know if we've got new money lately. I haven't seen any. You were going to run into the exact same problem every time. <clears throat> that continue to, to share these employees because there's going to be squabbles about which is the most equitable way to do it. And the only way to do it, to talk about my friend's example, just buy your own boat. Squire Tracy, thank you, Rick. Thanks, Judge. Um, actually, Robert, I think Robert mentioned that there was a need for a part-time county and a part-time city inspector. So that's how that all came about. Right. Um, so... Um, but just one quick question. Has there been any overtime work by the individual since August yes. 1st? Yes. Is the, city pay, is the city paying half of that? Yes. Yes. Isn't that right, Robert? I mean, we've, we're going to submit it to them. They said they were going to pay half of his salary. Didn't matter yes. whether it was overtime or not. So, yes. So, yes. Is, that turned in, is that turned in every two weeks like a pay period or is that turned in monthly? How, how is that, Robert? Uh, we invoice quarterly through the treasurer's office. Quarterly? Yes, sir. We, okay. we provide a list of, of inspections and, and the fees collected uh, and then the, the payroll. Okay. You also mentioned your permit software. Can you give me a breakdown on how many inspections have been done since August 1st in the city compared to the county? In 2020? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. 2020. Since uh, he started, I don't know where you are. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the county electrical inspector has does not have equipment provided to him to access the permit software, so he tracks his in a logbook. the The electrical inspector that we shared with the city was issued a iPad in which he used that to uh, log in because it's an internet based permit tracking software. My, my chief electrical inspector was just issued a smartphone when the pandemic hit so he could work mobile and, and at least uh, 
receive text messages and emails. I have submitted a request and we have received a quote for um, field laptops, the same as what the PVA office has used. And then the smartphones will provide the internet service to those devices. So I hope that that uh, request gets funded. Gotcha. Uh, in regards, you touched on the, uh, the COVID-19, the pandemic. Um, quick question. In regards to inspections, um, how are inspections going in regards to social distancing and so forth? Are they, are they the inspectors making um, contractors aware that they're in the, they're in the, uh, the building? Uh, are they asking them to walk, go outside? What, what, are the, what are we requiring of our general contractors when, when inspections are being done? Uh, what you stated is correct. Um, my inspectors give them a, a, a approximate time that they will arrive on scene. And I advise my inspectors and, the, and they say to the general contractors, uh, when my inspectors are in the facility, everyone needs to distance themselves. Uh, uh, the county provides my staff with uh, PPEs, uh, gloves, uh, sanitizer, uh, face masks. And uh, I've advised the inspectors that if a contractor refuses to provide uh, adequate distance that they are to leave the site and and report back to me. Okay, so just to be clear, it is and they are per performing inspections and it is okay that at your direction that contractors can be on site as long as social distancing is occurring. They can be on site when inspections are being performed by county staff. Yes, sir. They can't be on okay. site. We ask that they not be in the same room with them. Correct. Correct. But I got they, you. You know, they can be on the same job site. Yeah, that's great. We just ask that they get plenty of distance, plenty of space. Let, let our guys do their thing. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Judge. I, and, I, you know, sometimes uh, we're not able to share as much information from committee meetings, but... Uh, Squire Muller and I sit on uh, some personnel committee meetings and uh, as well as strategic planning. And in both of those meetings, we have discussed the possibility of utilizing contractors for this type of service because many surrounding communities do that and they do that successfully. And it's something that we could put into place, I would say, venture to say fairly quickly. Um, and, and again, uh, keep the services uh, ongoing. So I, I know we've had several uh, conversations about that in the past. So I don't want to leave that off of the table. I think when uh, Councillor Sparks was talking, he was talking specific, specifically about hiring employees, but uh, in other committees, we've induced, introduced other concepts. Uh, so I just want to continue to, to put that back out there in front of our court. Thank you very much. Judge Wilson, yeah, yeah. Uh, other thing, if yeah. I may judge on that issue, Squire Sebastian's correct. I was only referring to given the process that the court elected to do, doing given limitations, et cetera, that was perceived given the uh, amount contractors were going to require, lack of flexibility and accountability. Uh, under the conditions we've got right now, I was only referring to continuing the process where the court made the decision to hire employees along with the city. If that's the route, this is the way to solve it. If you're going to go a different direction, well, yeah, of course. Thank you, ma'am. Judge Wells, may I address the statement by Squire Sebastian? Please. Uh, previously, the, the court had mentioned the possibility or, or had asked me to look into the possibility of hiring a contract employee. Uh, going back to the beginning of what originated this contract, the city had a contract employee that they were utilizing for their uh, inspection services, um, which I believe is what led them to the table with the county to request a shared employee. That being said, uh, my staff did reach out directly to two contract employees who serve our surrounding communities. Without saying any names, the first inspector who services Woodford County and Nicholasville um, indicated to my 
staff that he was not interested in another jurisdiction and he's got more work than he than you know than he needs right now um and his fees are higher than ours the other inspector who serves shelby county um was not interested as well um uh, and his fees are set by the jurisdiction aside from from those issues my concern with the contract employee is is the the lack of um of of, of control over the scheduling if if we go with a contract employee who's already covering one or more jurisdictions and then adds ours to it um you know our administrative code says that, that we perform inspections on a first come first serve basis if we've got a contract employee who says, well, I can't be there for two weeks, there's nothing that Robert Hewitt nor the fiscal court can do to, to say to that and that contract inspector, we need you here tomorrow. That just can't happen because he's his own employee. So I have a very large concern with the lack of control over a contract employee. Squire Moore. You need to unmute. Probably best that I didn't unmute a minute ago there, Judge, but I've heard some really bad things on the contract employee in Woodford County. Yeah. Uh, how long of a period are you talking about here uh, for maybe, our inspector? Maybe a month, hopefully less than a month. The, the advertisement has already been issued. It was in last week's paper. It'll it, I believe it appeared in yesterday's paper and then it will appear in this weekend's paper as well i see betty joe on the on the meeting and i uh, i don't have the ad with me but she might have that deadline um yes i do you know. this is betty joe um the deadline is september 4th after that deadline we will go over the applications and see if they are um have the qualifications for it and so far too i have received three uh, Robert and I haven't reviewed those to see if they're qualified or not. So uh, we will do that after September 4. So I will tell you, I'm looking about the middle of October because time we can get interview and get this on court, it won't be until like in the September. And if somebody's working, they will have to give a two weeks notice. So I will say it's probably going to be, hopefully it'll be by the second week of October. Okay, thank you. Then I'll hold my third question then. I won't, I won't ask it. Graham Muller. Thank you, Judge. Robert, thank you for being on tonight. Would it be possible, I mean, kind of like uh, Squire Sebastian said, would it be possible to put something out? Um, you know, I've talked to uh, Fayette County numerous times about them uh, outsourcing some of their things, and it works flawlessly. I mean, instead of us sitting here just kind of guessing, will it work, will it not work? I mean, could we run an ad at the same time as that electrical inspector ad? to see if there's interest in our community from retired contractors. You know, we're, we're just kind of speculating right now. Is, can, can we go ahead and put something out there? Uh, because we are at kind of a pivotal point that if we wanted to incorporate that a little bit uh, when needed, uh, I'd just be curious to see how that looked. That, that's always a possibility. And, and at the direction of the court, I, I could, uh, along with Bejo, do that. I would like to advise the court that the city has experienced um, the use of a contract employee for an extensive period of time when their full-time electrical inspector was no longer employed. Um, I believe if, if uh, any of the magistrates would like to have a direct conversation with Mr. Cockley, he could advise you of his experiences dealing with a contract electrical inspector. Um, the other concern with um, attempting to to draw in an electrical inspector by contract um, is, is their proximity to the jurisdiction you know if, if you know because ultimately we would likely be charged drive time as well so you know I, I've reached out or my staff has reached out to inspectors who who are servicing adjacent counties if we are now going two and three counties out that's likely or has the potential to increase costs to either the county, the uh, constituent, or both. 
I, I guess I would like to at least see if there's a potential to put something out there, just to advertise it. I mean, who knows who lives here in this community now that might be interested in it. I mean, you know, uh, I would just like to see something like that. Well, the, the listing of, of uh, certified electrical inspectors by the state uh, are available. And so their, their locations are known. And so we know there are none in this county. You, you know, if, I could, if, if I could make just a humble suggestion and remind the court what the matter before the court is today, and I think these are frankly really great ideas. The question is, you're going to pay Mel more money for doing a, a greater job in the interim. During that time, I think the court should give diligent consideration, and and I, I appreciate the the com the complications that Mr. Hewis just described about contract inspector, et cetera, but do it on both frames. You've got a problem that you're facing right now, which you've got to have your electrical inspector uh, to do a certain job. And if you're not able to have an electrical inspector do that job, then you're not going to be able to fulfill that agreement to the people of this county of Frankfurt or the county of Franklin or the people of Frankfurt. If they can and you get this matter resolved, there's nothing wrong with trying to resolve or to address by way of contract or agreement some part-time ad hoc freelance inspector to, to fill in the blank. But your problem is right now that you don't have an inspector and you're not going to get one. It looks like for a while. So just don't lose focus while the discussion is to improve the situation. It's great. And, and you'll get there. But the issue is right now is, is getting over this hurdle to be able to get there. Squire so you're going to pay him or not. Squire Muller. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Judge. Robert, one last thing. So just out of curiosity, uh, did the electrical inspector ask for the money or are you asking for him? No. I'm the one asking for it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I, 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 I approached the judge executive before I discussed it with the employee. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, to be honest with you, I am not liking where this is going. Uh, We've got an ad out for uh, somebody, an electrical inspector, if he and they're from Frankfurt and they're watching this, do you think they feel secure about wanting to take a job when one magistrate's already said he's against it, the others are talking against it? Uh, I think y'all are hurting us here, guys. And if you're against it, if there's four votes against it, why are we going to waste our time and interviewing, putting a man's job on the line, this man could possibly resign from another position, take this and you turn around and say, ah, we don't want to do it. I mean, this is absurd what I'm hearing here. We need, we, we need some clarity and we need to move on and quit. We've talked for 45 minutes on a guy's getting a $5 increase and we're and we're now talking about maybe not even looking at a contractor to come in, costing this more money. So I don't know where you guys want to go with this, but it's it's not going in a good direction. Squire Blackburn, what would you like to say, sir? Thank yes, you. sir. Um, I know we've spent 45 minutes discussing it. Uh, I've spent 11 months asking. Um, so I'm just I'm just trying to get a contract renegotiated. Uh, Robert did say there's a website that has all the inspectors. There's none in Franklin County. There's none with active licenses. They have to uh, put their license in active uh, while they're performing electrical work and vice versa. If they do their inspection credentials, they have to put their electrical uh, license in active. So we have them here. We've got them applying. I've spoken to them. Um, there's, there is clarity. It just needs to be researched. We, we've heard a lot of negatives. Um, I'm for I'm for growth. I'm for moving forward. I'm not a, I'm not against any of this. I just I just think we're stuck in a rut that we're we just keep digging. So that's all I'm going to say. We can move on. Well, Judge Wells, a, a master electrician with an inspector certification in inactive status does not qualify, or does not mean that individual is a contract electrical inspector. Right. Right. But he has the credentials and can easily become one. Okay. All right. You're going to get to vote on this in just a moment.
Are there any other questions? If we're going to propose these rates, we need to talk about an amount. Okay. Um, so when it comes to voting time, uh, Robert is recommending between five and seven dollars an hour. So I would like for somebody to make, if there is somebody to make a um, a motion to pay X amount, and then we'll go through that process. Is that fair enough when it comes to, to voting in just a moment? All right, thank you. Okay, the uh, uh, next item on the agenda is author authorization to receive the treasurer's report. Susan. Yes, Court, you should have received a copy of the uh, receipts and expenditures as of the packet date. Uh, I won't belabor this, but I do need to make court aware of one area of liability. Uh, if you notice on the revenue report, we do have some subcategories under our net profit license category of revenue that we don't budget for. I, we just use them as, as subcodes to collect information. And that is for estimated payments and uh, extensions with estimated payments. I just want to make the court aware that we have a significant, maybe to the degree of $200,000 of a net profit um, estimated reconciliation that would go back to the vendor. Uh, this is something I think I've alluded to for some time, but the dollar amount has not been clear, but it, and, and it's being hashed out still, but I believe we're, we're close to having to make a reconciliation on that vendor uh, very soon. So I just wanna make court aware constantly on that net profit license line of receipts that there is an area that could result in some returns similar to, uh, similar to our, our KBI incentive program where we do rebates on the, that's on the payroll side though, it's not on the net profit side. So we'll probably have that coming up and that is not a budgeted uh, obligation, so it will require um, a, a court transfer, but it is our obligation through statute. So there's that. There's the, the bad news. Uh, the otherwise uh, uh, receipts and expenditures are, are booked by fund. And as I reported last court, the uh, federal funds uh, reflect the first receipt of our uh, CARES Act money. Questions? Okay. Any questions for Susan on, on that? Uh, Squire Tracy? No, sir. I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Susan, payment of bills. Any questions on the bills? Anybody have any questions on the bills? Seeing none. Okay. Th thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item is other business there. I have two items in other business. One is a, a voting item and one is informational item. The first one is, a, and I apologize, we got this in uh, uh, late, and but uh, they're asking for it as quickly as possible. The Bluegrass ad is, uh, it has a program that's, uh, they, uh, uh, of seven million dollars that they are implementing to for the workforce development to help people find jobs. Sherry, you were weren't you in workforce development at one time? Yes, sir. Spent the bulk of my career as the principal assistant to about six cabinet secretaries. So when you can be in a non-merit job that long, you got something in your pocket. Okay, um, Squire Tracy's laughing at you, but I'm not, I understand that, I, I think that's great. But you understand workforce development. Sherry, if you would, uh, since you're, explain how workforce development works, and that will kind of give everybody an understanding of, of where this agreement, what this agreement is. Uh, thank you, Judge. So back in the, uh, at the in the Jones administration, I believe it would have been uh, in the nineties. Then, yes, uh, there was seen a need to pull disparate groups from a variety of cabinets. Um, 
some of them in the cabinet for human resources at the time, some of them within the commerce cabinet, and some of them within the education, arts, and humanities cabinet. While they all had an educational component, which is critical to workforce development, because education and training is the bedrock of being able to put a qualified employee and pair them with a suitable position. Uh, there was the lack of focus while those agencies were within those cabinets on the workforce part of it. And so creating the Cabinet for Workforce Development, uh, which had Sandy Goopser as the first cabinet secretary, the current budget director, John T. Hicks, as our uh, budget director, uh, sitting around a small table trying to put these things together uh, to focus on the workforce component and not lose sight of the education and training that is involved within that. So while I uh, was there working in the patent administration, the Workforce Investment Act became av available at the federal level and I was tapped to write the first state plan for workforce investment. And Kentucky was recognized as one of the first five states in, in the United States to put together a statewide program that would invest in local communities to make them work ready through education and training to get qualified workers for the jobs uh, that were within the community. And as that has advanced since the late 90s, we looked at providing like industry sectors, uh, some pockets of the state are, for example, Louisville has a high medical uh, component. So there are track for education and training there for medical type jobs. There's uh, shipping and logistics, and there are a variety of, uh, of tracks uh, that workforce goes across the Commonwealth. So uh, it, it's a it's a a very deep well to go down and most certainly something that we need to invest uh, within our community. I noticed uh, uh, Carmen Inman had talked about one of the things that she wanted to do before she steps away from her position is to ensure that Frank Frankfort Franklin County becomes a workforce ready community, which means that we have education and training credentials available within our community so that a host of jobs could come looking and we force to fill the needs of those individuals so of those individual companies so that's I mean that is a super quick down and dirty on workforce that was good thank you I appreciate it so this is uh with the 17 counties of the bluegrass ad and it, it virtually oversees $7 million of the companies that, that uh, they pick to uh, the $7 million that will go to these 17 counties. Um, Lexington is going to be part of it. And Lexington uh, was actually wanted to separate out and take a lot of the money, but uh, they, they have agreed. Mayor Gordon is a good person and has agreed to uh, uh, stay in as long as uh, they can she and another person will be the chair of the uh, uh, board, the executive board, which I am a member of. So with that, uh, that has come on and they, uh, they're they asking that we get this done as quickly as possible so they can move forward and get this money out and, and uh, into, the, into the counties. That's what this is about. Squire Booth. Can't, can't hear you. Sorry. Sorry. Are we asked to make a plan or are we asked to give them money? No, we don't give them money. No, this is, this is, we don't give them money. They actually come in and spend money in our county. So we're this, coming up with a the plan then? No, we don't have, we don't do the plan. The plan is from a board. All we're doing is, is, is saying that this organization, the Bluegrass Ad and its 17 counties, uh, will we agree will handle the monies uh, to, to get out into the, our communities. And we don't have to say how we're going to do it. We just take the money and run. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> the boards will say how to do it. Let's don't say take the money and run. Let's just say that there will be a plan, but we don't have to develop the plan. Oh. Even though Sherry would be great at developing the plan. And if, yes. if I would bring Sherry in in a heartbeat to develop the plan, but but that's not part of it at this point. Okay. 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 
All right. That's the first item. The second item, uh, and I'm sure all of you all are seeing this, uh, the campaign signs are coming out. And uh, so I've asked Robert to uh, review our, uh, our ordinance about campaign signs. So Robert, if you would, uh, you're speaking to the squires as well as the community uh, with this information. Appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. Um, Squires, you were emailed uh, regulations from both the city and the county sign ordinances, since you represent constituents both within the city and the county. And I want to briefly summarize the election sign rules for, uh, for both the county as, as well as the city. So first of all, just let, as, remind everyone, November 3rd is the election. Both the city and the county identify campaign signs as exempt signs, which means we do not require the issuance of permits. They are allowed in, in private property. They, they are not allowed in the right of way and uh, uh, are prohibited from obstructing uh, traffic view sheds, if you will, intersections, driveways, alleyways, things of that nature. There is a difference between the city and the county regulations uh, as to both when signs can go out and when signs need to be brought back in. Um, in the city under Article 13, Section 13.16, it clearly identifies uh, this sign type as exempt, once again, not requiring a permit. And under item L of that section, um, it identifies them specifically as a sign identifying a campaign event. Uh, while it does not say within the city ordinance when the sign can go out, it specifically says such sign shall be removed within five days after the special campaign drive or event. Okay, so city, no requirement on, on how soon it can go out, but it has to come back within five days or removed from the property. On the county side, the sign ordinance is covered in Article 11. Section 11.10, it's identified as an election sign. Uh, subsections B and C says that the signs uh, for uh, election signs may be erected for a period not to exceed 60 days prior to any primary or general election. Election signs shall be re removed within 10 days after the election or after the termination of a candidacy, whichever occurs first no building permit shall be required for the issuance of election signs. So therefore, based on the county ordinance outside the city limits, campaign signs uh, can uh, be established and set up beginning on September the 4th. Uh, with that, I can, I can answer any questions you may have. Any questions? No, but I'll make a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, there's uh, a few signs from one individual that never came down and still up from the primary. Just an observation. Uh, um, um, issues of non-compliance, we often contact the campaign headquarters. We, we try not to remove those signs. Uh, we ask for, for self-compliance. Um, if, if we're unable to make contact with the campaign headquarters, we will remove those, but we, we would like to deliver those back to the campaign. Okay, any other questions? Robert, thank you for that report. Uh, in, important this time of year, getting to be more important in just a few weeks. Okay, uh, the last uh, item is the constitu constitutional Judge. officers and department heads. Squire Tracy. Judge, just one quick question. Would you clarify the P and Z building inspectors pay rate increase, please? The, the P and Z's uh, inspectors say that again. P pay rate, what is what they're being yeah. paid right now? Yeah. Would you clarify the P and Z inspectors pay rate increase? The building inspectors, please. It, the the proposed increase. Now this looks like he's already received it. Judge Wells, this is in reference to the expanded jurisdiction. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. For the building inspector. Yeah, okay, go ahead, go ahead, Robert. Uh, I'm not logged in downtown. 
However, uh, on August the 3rd, and, and uh, Deputy Judge and, and HR Director, correct me if I uh, missed some dates here. On August the 3rd, the county received notification from the AG's office approving the agreement between Franklin <coughs> County and the Kentucky Department of Housing, Building, and Construction. Uh, later that week, the county received their first application uh, for construction falling under the expanded jurisdiction um, um, for our local building inspectors. So that is when the county uh, building inspectors salary in a 2020 was uh, was uh, modified. It was, I believe, uh, dated it August the 3rd. So he, he was... Uh, his salary was changed based on the ordinance from 2017, uh, and he be immediately began plan review of the project. Does that answer your question? It does. Just quick question. I know in, in the past you had mentioned that the previous court had voted on and approved that. Um, looking back through my notes, on 724-17, it was on the agenda. There was a compensation committee meeting at 4 p.m., followed by a 5 p.m. Uh, court meeting, that item was pulled off of the agenda and, and not voted on. Do you, do, you, do you have any idea when that was actually approved by the previous court like we were told it was? I can pull that. I wasn't aware that's what they were. I had pulled some records for Squire Tracy earlier yeah, today. Yeah, if you, you um, didn't ask for that, if you had asked for that, we would have had that for you. I asked for the I asked for the compensation meeting minutes and there were none. There was only one item on the agenda, which was what was pulled off of our meeting uh, agenda. So uh, I, I'm just asking for clarity is all I'm asking for. We were told that or this court was told that the previous court voted on and approved it. So I'm just asking for a and, copy. And, and that documentation, I'm pretty sure, was included with the um, expanded jurisdiction packet agreement. Yeah, the, well, you got it. It was in there the other day or a couple so, of weeks ago when you got it. Okay, so my question is this. Can I get a copy of the information that shows the previous court voted on and approved this action like this court was told they did yes so i'm asking for it. yeah you, yes. you'd already gotten it it was in your packet uh a while back and so it was in there then but we'll send it to you but okay you didn't thank ask you for that this time and okay. I'm so we'll no, you're fine. yeah and by the way robert you have uh you want to make a somewhat a special announcement about the uh what's happened in just virtually the same day he's got that Yes, sir. So the the pay rate adjustment approved by the court back in 2017, um, and, and I don't have the document in front of me. Uh, it was roughly uh, an annual increase of, I believe it was 10,600. Betty Jo, perhaps you could could verify that. The the application, the building permit application alone for our first project the fee was $11,900. Fire sprinkler fee is, is in addition to that. Um, and then there are other uh, fees subsequent to that. Uh, my staff presented a deposit from my department to the treasurer the other day of over $10,000 with additional funds to come. That's the first one, right? Of many more. Yes, sir, there are more in the works. That's great, okay. Squire Sebastian. Thank you, Judge. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the uh, comprehensive plan update. Um, and, I, and I've asked a couple of questions about that. We're in the, the time frame for this to happen. Okay. And uh, I, think Robert I, I was wanted just in to know. Uh, just wanted to know the status of that so we can make the community aware of the comprehensive plan update. It seems like we've had a, a lot of interest in property throughout the community and now's the time to do that roll up your sleeves, mm -hmm. get as many people as possible involved and, and get down into the uh, weeds on it because it sounds like that that hasn't been done for quite some time here in Franklin County. 
appreciate right. any updates we can get to pass along to our very interested constituents. Okay, Robert. Thank you, sir. Kirk Harris, Chapter 100 of the Comprehensive Plan is required to be reviewed and, and uh, reconsidered or, or readopted uh, on an annual five or every five years. August 26, 2020, 10 a.m., both myself, Planning Director Eric Cockley with the City of Frankfurt had a meeting with the Planning Commission Chairman, Vice Chairman, and Legal Counsel to discuss the upcoming Conference of Plan update. Um, in summary, the discussion was to uh, for the uh, for a the Planning Commission to adopt a steering committee and appoint a certain number of members. The fiscal court and the city commission should anticipate a letter from planning commission chairman Jackson in the very near future. Robert, can you go through that list? You, you rattled off some titles there yourself, uh, Eric Cockley, the planning commission chairman, you said legal counsel, was that both from the city and the county and then someone else? Uh, the legal counsel. Um, uh, they have their own legal uh, counsel, uh, the county attorney okay. and the yeah, that, that would be the board's attorney. Yeah, the board okay. has their own attorney. Okay. That is and, Ed Logan. Yeah. And 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 who else was involved in this uh with in this public meeting that you all had on August 26th? Well, it was a staff meeting, it was not a public meeting, it was not a committee oh. meeting. Oh, okay. So that's why we we're not sure. Okay, so you said it was Eric, yourself, uh the planning commission chair, Jack. Jackson, Charon, the planning commission, right? Legal attorney, legal counsel, and who else? Who else was involved? The vice, the vice chairperson, Jim Nickel. Okay, and and so it was decided. Can you go through that? What this small group is going to put forth, at least, and make some uh, make us aware of? Can you just kind of give us a very quick thumbnail one more time? I just, I think I missed something. I, I just want to make sure I understand it. That's all. Thank you. So the chairman Jackson will discuss with the planning commission at the next meeting, the next planning commission meeting, the establishment of a steering committee for the comprehensive plan update. He will also direct staff at that time to prepare a letter to both uh, Judge Wells and Mayor May uh, requesting an appointment to serve on that steering committee, along with a select number of planning commission members. You want to be that appointment, Squire Sebastian? Well, what I'm what I'm trying to figure out here is if this steering committee is that going to be a, a set number of people? Uh, is that I mean, are we trying to have a a smaller group? I think maybe shepherd the process. Is that what? the steering committee would do in in my previous experience that what that's really what your steering committee does but in, in this instance i'm i'm not sure i just want to make sure i understand well i, I think you're speculating uh he said that Charon, uh, chairman's going to decide and do that you're you're uh, maybe he maybe just said he was gonna no what what i'm trying to figure out is he said he would establish a steering committee and i don't know if that's uh, yeah, but you're, my point is you're asking the wrong person. You're asking Robert. Robert ain't got no dog in that fight. That's something. Jerry I'm Jackson sorry. Covered. The only reason that I'm asking Robert is uh, if you've watched Hamilton, he was in the room. I was not in the room, so I'm not real sure uh, who who has information mm -hmm. to share with us. That's all I'm asking. I'm, I'm just pointing out that all of these decisions has been told many, many times. Gets handed down from on high by way of planning commission. Um, we're, we're sort of observers from afar and this loose affiliation of millionaires and billionaires, and they all get to decide how they're going to govern it. And then the county makes input, et cetera. The, the court has devolved into the planning commission for, for a bunch of really good reasons. And you're going to be limited and I, and I understand how frustrating that is for a number of reasons, but chairman Jackson's going to run that show and set up his chair or his committee and then assign the 100 people or 50, whatever it was, I think discussed the last time as part of that final, final decision that they've got to make. I don't think it's fair to be putting Robert under the gun because he was just in the room. That's going to ask, ask Chairman Jackson. Okay. I, you know, again, 
That was my only comment. He was in the room, so I don't know what was discussed. I'm, I'm just trying to get at that. Thank you. All right. Is there anything else? Department heads, constitutional officers. I've got one other thing. Good news, so, right? Sunshiny thing. We've got $20,783.82 returned to us from Keiko All Lines Fund. And that is great uh, to have that kind of money given back to us from our, uh, from Keiko. So thank you, Keiko. We appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Just, okay. Can, can I ask one more question? Um, at some point, uh, can we have an update? Uh, can this be put on our agenda to have an update about uh, pending legal uh, issues? I think maybe the last time we heard from uh, our counselor Sparks probably was last year. And I know I had asked for it just to kind of understand the nature of what we had out there, but it's probably been a while. So at some point, could we put that on a future agenda, maybe the next agenda to kind of go through that quickly with us? Right. When Councilor Sparks is ready, uh, we'll do it. Councilor Sparks, we'll just count on you. You just let Tamara know, and we'll get it on the agenda when you're ready to, to do it again. Yeah, is that clear? Oh. Is that okay with you, sir? Yes, sir. Uh, Squire, I'll, I'll pull those and try to get something ready for the next meeting or next. That's Fantastic. And, yeah. and I did want to have uh, one more comment. Councilor Sparks and I have been meet, have met on the uh, administrative code, mm -hmm. and we've uh, – talked a little bit about it. We've got some more discussions to have, but just wanted to make sure the court was aware that we were per our charge to get moving on that and we're we're doing so. And Squire on that, I'm also not letting any moss grow on that particular rock um, <laughs> as part and parcel of, of some changes and some, some technical revisions as you and I discussed. Um, I put those together to try to submit to our codification process uh, to just clean up some things, as, as the court just heard today, you've got a, a, a code with the jail dealing with uh, sexually orientation, gender identity, et cetera, that was not amended when we admitted when we amended our admin code back historically. So this is another good opportunity to try to catch all of these things to put them back on square. And I appreciate the squire's willingness to take her time to go through that not so simple process sometimes paragraph by paragraph and we have not let it just roll thank you sherry yeah, absolutely appreciate it sir thank you all right everybody ready to go to the uh voting meeting okay um now we will go to uh, officially call this meeting to order this is the franklin county fiscal court voting meeting of august 27 2020 Clerk, call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Here. Squire Blackburn. Here. Squire Muller. Present. Squire Tracy. Here. Squire Booth. Present. Squire Moore. Here. Judge Wells. Here. Would everybody please stand for the pledge? Squire Moore, since you have the flag behind you, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to our great country? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United of, America, States of America and the Republic, for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Squire. That was quick. <laughs> I didn't omit God, and I won't ever. So. Well, all right. So Nobody asked quick. you to either. We glad, we're glad you didn't. I know you wouldn't let Judge. Okay, um, the first item on the agenda is authorization approval of minutes from our regular meeting of August the 7th, 2020. So moved. Moved by Squire Sebastian. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Squire Muller. Discussion? Call the roll. Squire Sebastian? Yes. Squire Blackburn? Yes. Squire Muller? Yes. Squire Tracy? Yes. Squire Booth? Yes. Squire Moore? Yes. Judge Wells? Yes. Next item is authorization to accept Elkhorn Water District's audit report for the years ended December 31st, 2019 and 2018. So moved. Second. Okay, Squire Tracy and Squire Muller? Yes. Discussion? 
Call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. Yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Yes. The next item is authorize, authorization to approve the appointment of Brad Gregory to the Elkhorn Water District Board, replacing Mike Dudgeon, who will miss very much. So moved. Has, so moved. Uh, I heard Squire Tracy and Squire Blackburn. Okay. Call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. Uh, yes. And I just want to say that I've, I've known uh, Mr. Gregory for, for several years. He's an upstanding guy. He's a, a great asset to the community in Schweitzer. And uh, I'm glad he's chose to serve on this board. Squire Muller. I'd like to take this time to thank Michael Dudgeon again for doing an excellent job on the board and his uh, community service. And he spoke highly of this applicant. So I look forward to working for working with him. I'm a yes. Squire Tracy. Um, yes. And uh, Brad will be a, uh, a great addition to the board. Uh, so yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Yes, and once again, I want to thank uh, Mike Dudgeon, and I wish him well. Uh, him and his uh, wife have obviously moved, and they uh, have a business, and I hope that that goes very well, and we wish them all the best. And thanks again, Mike, for your great service. The next item is authorization to approve a resolution permitting a credit of one half of 1% occupational tax license fee for new employees as part of an economic development project by the Recon Group Incorporated under the Kentucky Business Investment Program. So moved. Moved by Squire Blackburn. Second. Seconded by Squire Muller. Discussion? Call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Uh, uh, yes. Um, I'm going to explain my vote. And I, while I have tremendous trepidation about binding two courts, two and a half courts to a 10 year agreement on this. It has been very clearly stated by our county treasurer that so far we have six or seven of these active and have had no rebates yet requested. So I'm going to cautiously vote yes on this. Squire Blackburn. Um, I, I vote yes. And I, I think it's a, a great incentive to draw jobs in our community and, and I hope it's successful and, and if we start paying these rebates out, it's because we're, we're bringing jobs in. So I'm a big yes. Squire Muller? Yes. Squire Tracy? Yes. Squire Booth? Yes. Squire Moore? Uh, in a times when we're denying zone changes for development, I think this is a great thing. So I definitely vote yes. Judge Wells? Yeah, I'm, uh, Squire Blackburn, I think you said it the best. Uh, I mean, this is bringing jobs into our community. This is 90 jobs, uh, and we need jobs uh, desperately. We, we need to get back to work, and so I vote yes. The next item is authorization to approve an order of, order of allowance to the Board of Assessment uh, Appeals. Board of Assessment and Appeals. So moved. Squire Tracy. Second. Seconded by Squire Sebastian. Call rope. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. Yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Yes. Next item is authorization to declare a property from the sheriff's office as surplus for disposal by auction. So moved. Second. Uh, all right, you got that? Call the roll. Muller and Blackburn. Yes, okay. Muller and Blackburn. Uh -huh. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. I want to thank the sheriff for being creative, for finding ways to squeeze money, make money, uh, buy things. He's He's been a tremendous asset in the position of sheriff, and I vote yes. Yeah. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore? Yes. Judge Wells? Yes. Next item is authorization to purchase a 2020 Chevrolet Tahoe from the state master agreement for the sheriff's office. 
So moved. Second. Squire Sebastian. Call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Um, we definitely need uh, operational vehicles that can work out in our counties. Uh, and I've heard recently in, in my area that there have been a rash of break-ins. I think that's uh, expanding into Squire Booth's district as well. So we want these folks on the road. So I enthusiastically vote yes. Squire Blackburn. I have to echo her comments. Uh, losing that new Silverado uh, the way we did, and and thankfully, uh, Officer Wilburn's fine. But uh, I'm glad we're replacing it with a good solid vehicle. And I'm a yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Yes, and I I agree. Uh, we're glad that the that the uh, deputy is okay. The next item is uh, authorization to amend the jail's policy and procedure manual, personnel and harassment. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. Yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Yes. The next item is authorization to approve to approve the approve entering into a personal service contract with the Summerhill Group LLC to assist Franklin County to prepare submit a proposal to the U.S. Marshal Service and negotiate a new per diem rate for intergovernmental service agreement. Uh, see uh, hashtag J dash B three two dash M dash six five zero for the jail. So move. Seconded by Squire Blackburn. Second. I got Squire Blackburn. Uh, okay, call the roll. Squire Sebastian. I uh, just want to applaud the, the jail staff for their initiative to increase the per diem rate. I hope this goes well. Sounds like with the track record of the Summerhill Group, we can expect good things. So I am a yes. Squire Blackburn. I'm glad after 32 years we're re renegotiating the contract. I'm a yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Sometimes Squire Blackburn, it just takes a while. <laughs> yes. Next item is first reading of an ordinance relating to the 2020 Franklin County tax rates for real and personal property, aircraft, watercraft, non-commercial and 2021 tax rates for motor vehicle and watercraft. Public hearing on September 8th at five o'clock for citizen, citizen comments. And the second reading and vote will be at September, the September 15th at five o'clock meeting. And I'm going over, I wanna read this. If you um, are interested in being on the video teleconference, you can contact Andrew Tippett, internet and technology coordinator by email at atippet at franklincountyky.com to, to obtain the, the video conference uh, login information. If you want to make a written comment, these comments will be read aloud during the public hearing and may be submitted by email to atippet at franklincountyky.com or by U.S. mail to Franklin County Fiscal Court. Attention, 2020 proposed tax rate public hearing 321 West Main Street, Frankfort, Kentucky, 40601. Written comments must be received in the office no later than 5 p.m. on September 8th, 2020. That's the first reading. The next item of the agenda is authorization to approve a resolution relating to the 2020 uh, Franklin County tax rates for insurance capital and bank deposits. So moved. I uh, heard, Squire Booth, did you second? Yes. Uh, now I moved, but I, I didn't give you enough time to read it, I think, so I'll take it back if necessary. Mm -hmm. Just make a second. <laughs> Just say I second. I second. There you go. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, call the roll. Squire Sebastian? Yes. Squire Blackburn? Yes. Squire Muller? Yes. Squire Tracy? Yes. Squire Booth? Yes. 
Squire Moore? Yes. Judge Wells? Yes. Next item is authorization to approve an agreement with DLZ Kentucky Incorporated to provide engineering services and design for Gregory Woods Bridge replacement. So moved. Second. Discussion? Call the roll. Squire Sebastian? Yes. Squire Blackburn? I should have seconded that because I'm probably going to need a bridge here soon. But uh, I vote yes. <laughs> so is that a yes? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Squire Muller? Yes. Squire Tracy? Yes. Squire Booth? Yes. Squire Moore? Oh, I second that because I've got a bridge in the making right now. So, yes. Judge Wells? Uh, yes. <laughs> Authorization. The next item is authorization to approve a temporary salary increase, uh, which is left blank to the chief electrical inspector while serving in a dual capacity and performing inspections for the city of Franklin. If I make the motion, have... Judge, that we temporarily give a five dollar raise to chief electrical inspector. Okay. If, if, do you second that, Squire no, Booth? No. I make a, another motion that we temporarily increase the salary by seven dollars uh, of oh. the uh, only electrical inspector for the county and city. Okay, we have two motions on the floor. Let's have a discussion. Uh, Judge, if I may, just for qualification purposes, you can only have one motion at the floor at a time. There's been a motion and second as to five. And if that's okay. defeated, then Marty's motion would be appropriate as to the amount. That's I'm sorry that that you're right. That's Robert rules of order. So we will uh, ascertain a second for Squire Moore was first. So we'll ascertain a second for Squire Moore's $5 an hour increase. Is there a second? Seeing that there's not a second, uh, your motion dies, Squire Moore, for lack of second. Okay, Squire Booth, you want to make a motion again? I move that we temporarily increase the salary to by seven dollars uh, for the city <laughs> county electrical inspector. Okay, there's a motion now on the floor for $7. Is there a second? Oh, Sherry, are you, nobody's gonna second e e any of these. Okay, is there another motion on the floor for any other amount of money? And you, we could, Squire Moore, Squire's Booth, if you can compromise and agree, we could get a motion and a second and move on. Uh, if, if you all will agree on, on a uh, figure. Judge, I'll, I'll repeat my motion for a temporary $5 raise for the Chief Electrical Inspector. Okay. Squire Booth, would you be willing to second that? I'll second it. Okay. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second for $5 an hour. Clerk, call the roll. Squire Sebastian? No. <clears throat> Squire Blackburn? I just want to say that uh, for the record, for clarity, um, we need electrical inspectors. We need building inspectors. We need the process to be smooth. Uh, we need to not only provide the service, but use it as an educational tool to help the, the builders and developers in our community. I think uh, that's, that's the key. Um, with that being said, um, I'm totally for having everything we need, but I've been trying for 11 months to get a, a contract renegotiated and the city has not wanted to even address it until lately. So I'm a no until on, on raising anybody's salary or, or even hiring anybody until we get that contract renegotiated. I'm a no. Squire Muller? No. Squire Tracy? Uh, staying consistent with years past, I vote no. Squire Booth? Yes. Squire Moore? Yes. Judge Wells? Let me, uh, and 
I'm, I know I'm talking to the wall, but I want to remind you that uh, uh, <laughs> we are actually saving money here. The city is paying half of the salary of our one inspector that's doing both city and county work now by himself, working long hours, working many hours, <laughs> and uh, putting in a lot of time. And he's doing it graciously. And he's not complaining. TV, yeah. Pardon me? He is not stay in your room. He is not complaining a bit. And so uh, $5 an hour is, is a very modest. And it's unfortunate that he's not going to get that as extra pay. But I do vote yes. And I appreciate Mel Trivet for what you're doing. And I'm sorry that this court didn't see that you could get this raise. Okay, the next item on the agenda is authorization to receive the treasurer's report. So moved. Second. All the roll. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire <clears throat> yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells? Yes. Next item is payment of bills. Is there a motion to deny any payment of, on any of the bills? Seeing none, let the record reflect that the bills are to be paid. Next item is authorization to amend the agenda to add interlocal agreement, uh, on interlocal agreement with the bluegrass head. I'm gonna put that on there. It's not on there, but I'm gonna put that on. So moved. Okay. Second. Call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. Yes. Squire Muller. Yes. Squire Tracy. Yes. Squire Booth. Yes. Squire Moore. Yes. Judge Wells. Yes. The next item is authorization to approve a workforce development interlocal cooperative agreement with the Bluegrass Ad. I thought that just worked on I'm sorry. Did you say you made a motion? I can't hear you. I thought you just made a motion to that. Uh, I mean, to add it. We made a motion to add it. Yes. And so now we're voting on it. Oh, okay. So moved. Okay. Uh, Squire Second. Sebastian. Seconded by Squire Blackburn. Call the roll. Squire Sebastian. Yes. Squire Blackburn. Yes. Squire Muller. Uh, I'd like to take a minute to thank Carmen Inman for all her service at the Chamber of Commerce. She'll be retiring in a couple of weeks. And she's worked on this a lot, so I'm a yes. Squire Tracy? Yes. Squire Booth? Yes. Squire Moore? Yes. Judge Wells? Yes. Uh, is there an authorization to adjourn? So moved. Second. Call the roll. Squire Sebastian? Yes. Squire Blackburn? Yes. Squire Muller? Yes. Squire Tracy? Yes. Squire Booth? Yes. Squire Moore? Yes. Judge Wells? Before I say yes, I want to remind everybody, we are in a pandemic and the COVID crisis is for real. Wear your mask and be safe when you go out. Next item I want to uh, say on behalf of all of us in Franklin County, we wish our thoughts and prayers to those of you that have suffered so much from Hurricane Laura as it is heading uh, through Louisiana and into Arkansas. And I say to us as a residents, let's all be careful because we are going to receive some winds and some rain in probably tonight, tomorrow, and Saturday. So all be careful. With that, I vote yes to adjourn. And we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. That was easy. Thanks, uh, folks. Y'all be safe. Be careful.